Um, welcome, everyone, to this, the 15th meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2017. And can I remind members and others in the room to switch their phones and other devices to silent? Can I welcome <coughs> Michelle Ballantyne to her first meeting of the Public Petitions Committee? And the agenda item one is a declaration of interest in accordance with the terms of the interest of members of the Scottish Parliament Act 2006. I invite Michelle Ballantyne to declare any interest relevant to the remit of this committee. Yes, can I just advise, please, that I am still a sitting councillor on Scottish Borders Council. Thank you. Thank you very much for mm -hmm. that. If we can now move to our second agenda item, and this is evidence on four new petitions. The first petition we will take evidence on is petition 1655 on Scotland's national scenic areas. This petition was submitted by Christine Metcalf on behalf of Avic and Kilcrenan Community Council. And can I welcome Christine to the meeting, along with Alan Mitchell, who is a member of the Community Council, and Douglas Wynne, who is assisting with the petition in a personal capacity. Can I thank you very much for attending this morning. Can I welcome you, and we look forward to hearing um, your statement. You have the opportunity to make a brief opening statement of up to five minutes, and after that, the committee will ask a few questions to help inform our consideration of the petition. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, the National Scenic Areas, NSA, were initially identified by the Countryside Commission for Scotland in 1978 uh, publication Scotland's Scenic Heritage, which defined them as areas of national scenic significance of unsurpassed attractiveness, which must be conserved as part of our national heritage. They were incorporated into planning legis legislation by order of the Secretary of State in 1980 and subsequently designated in 2010. They are now administered by Scottish Natural Heritage, which must be consulted on major developments within NSAs. By far the most significant and widespread landscape impacts in recent decades have been from onshore wind farms and Scottish <coughs> Planning po Policy, SPP, of June 23rd, 2014, states that wind farms will not be acceptable within national parks and NSAs. SPP adds that significant protection will be accorded conditionally to wildland areas as mapped by SNH in 2014. The founding document of NSAs recognised that landscape conservation should be open to revision, to quote, there will be many further areas which informed readers may consider should also have been included. We believe that many such areas will be of interest to local communities. <clears throat> In such cases, it will be important for these areas to be identified and conserved by the local authorities concerned. Despite this, the 40 NSAs have remained exactly as originally mapped in 1978 and still cover the same 13% of the land area of Scotland. In 2015, in relation to an earlier petition, PE1564, the Scottish Government indicated that it had no plans to designate any further NSAs, and this position was restated in an answer to question S5W05139 in late 2016. In our judgment, the scale and rapid spread of major developments, largely but not exclusively wind farm construction, in Scotland's most sensitive and vulnerable scenic areas, requires a much more dynamic policy response from the Scottish Government than simple reliance on a four-decade-old mapping of protected landscapes. We accept that SNH's 2014 wildland area mapping does offer some protection to other valued areas, but this is conditional and explicitly can be overcome by siting, design or other mitigation. In our judgment, the SNH wildland area mapping is not sufficiently robust in its current scoping to offer reliable protection 
uh, to our remaining and rapidly diminishing wild landscapes unless or until there was a greater presumption against large-scale developments in the wildland areas. We suggest that the current severe threats to landscape conservation in Scotland requires a thorough review and ideally expansion of the number and scoping of Scotland's national scenic areas. There has been considerable dispute in respect of the impacts of wind farms on the ability of remote settlements to attract foreign and domestic tourists and thereby diversify often fragile economies. In brief, the evidence shows an increasing tendency for tourists to perceive the presence of large wind farms as detrimental to their enjoyment of Scotland's landscape and nature, with the proportion increasing strongly now with the current rapid ex expansion of wind farms. Evidence on socio-economic outcomes is unavoidably much more difficult as we have neither adequate data nor methodologies to allow any definitive conclusions. We will be happy to address any questions on this and believe that an expansion of NSAs to give greater protection to our iconic landscapes in the undesignated 87% would help greatly to strengthen Scotland's tourism offer. There are many potential candidates for new designation, but we would suggest Loch Hoare and Argyll as, as an example of increasingly rare, tranquil environments in an unspoilt landscape. This loch is narrow and therefore vulnerable in significant detrimental impacts from any large renewable energy or infrastructure projects on either side. The area also includes the Glenetive and Glenfine Golden Eagle Special Protection Area. As you will know, this petition has the support of at least one minister. Should Loch Hall's value and need to be so designated subsequently be approved, that would be greatly welcomed by the tourist industry, visitors and residents alike. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for that. If I can maybe <coughs> open up the question, you, you do um, ask for a review of the process of designation of NSAs, and you've also indicated that in recent years the Scottish Government has said there's no plans to designate any further NSAs. Is there a flaw in the process, then, that the Government just simply says they're not going to do this, and how would you address that? Um, or is there a concern that simply in policy terms, the Scottish Government has no desire to designate any further NSAs, presumably because they see it as in conflict, perhaps, with policy around wind farms and renewable energy. Yes, I, th I think um, the, the, it speaks for itself that it's, it's been four decades um, since there's been any um, increase. Um, I don't know whether my colleague um, might feel that you've got something to say on that. Can I ask... Um, Chair, the, the, um, the issue is not so much the ability of the Scottish Government to review these as, as I think, as you imply in your second option, the, the willingness. Um, the, the, there is no doubt that uh, the Scottish Government has been quite cautious in its uh, approach to landscape conservation uh, to leave room, essentially, for the, the, uh, the carbon policies that it's currently following. Uh, and yet the, the difficulty is <clears throat> that the, the areas of, of Scotland uh, from which uh, large industrial structures are visible on the SNH's own, own uh, mapping has increased over a five-year period until they stopped doing such things in 2013 uh, from 65% to 73% of Scotland's total area from which large industrial uh, constructions are, are visible. Uh, SNH has not uh, continued that mapping. It's the Natural Heritage Indicator uh, scheme that they, they published in uh, November of 2014. And it, it is our concern that, that the weighting is uh, too much towards uh, liberating uh, large-scale industrial development and not enough on landscape conservation. Uh, that, that's, uh, I think, our, our perception. 
Thank you very much for that. Uh, Rona Mackay? Yes, good morning. Um, your petition calls for the, an increase in the number of um, national scenic areas to protect the natural landscape and support the tourism sector. Um, you, you've addressed a lot of um, uh, your, these, the points I'm going to ask you in the opening statement. I wonder if I could just ask you to expand on your concerns about the scale and spread of the major developments that have been going on and what other options do you consider might be available to protect the natural landscape and support the tourism sector? I, I think the the really the um, the ability of the country to or the parliament to increase the um, national scenic areas and and national parks really um, when you look at, at what the protection is within with within the um, uh, the ability of the of these areas to be protected it, it really is um, down to the government to make sure that those areas are enough um, to provide um, Scotland with the protection that it needs that we have enough of them because at the moment um, uh, with local plans and, and things the the government are um, making sure that um, policy um, local local governments when local plans are um, uh, presented they they often cannot put their own protection in um, in place because the Scottish government has a particular will to impose what they want to do um, I don't know whether Douglas, you have more the, to say on that. The Section 36 process takes, of course, the, the uh, consenting for large-scale wind farms out of the hands of local authorities, as you'll, you'll know well. Uh, and uh, over recent years, the majority of the applications have, have been successful, e even some in quite sensitive areas. The, the wild land designations uh, explicitly are only conditional protection. Uh, they they uh, they do um, the wildland uh, identification, the wildland map by SNH uh, only offers uh, uh, what the the government calls significant protection, but that has been overridden in a number of cases. Uh, in the case of Strone Lerg, uh, the wildland map was uh, explicitly uh, redrawn in order to facilitate the wind farm. Uh, and, and there's been another recent wind farm uh, consented on wildland areas. I should say uh, that, that what we're asking is not simply that new national scenic areas uh, should be considered, but also the boundaries of existing ones. Uh, for example, if, if you look at uh, taking the particular example of, of Loch Awe and its surroundings, if you, if you look at the, the map of, of wildland areas, wildland area 9 includes the summit ridge of Kruachan, Ben Kruachan, which is a, a, an iconic mountain. Um, I know it's hollow because you've got the, the pump storage scheme within it, but from the outside, from a, a landscape pers perspective, that is not obvious. So the, the summit ridge of Kruachan is within wildland area 9, but it's not within the National Scenic Area of Glencoe uh, and, and Ben Nevis. Uh, and it, it's questions such as that that, that really should, should be asked. Why does uh, the National Scenic Area of, of Glencoe and Ben Nevis not include that iconic mountain, which is right on its borders? Uh, we're not unreasonable. We, we, we understand that Scottish government wants to facilitate uh, industrial structures. Uh, we we doubt whether the balance is right between that wish and the the conservation of iconic landscapes. Uh, and there is no wildland uh, area designation. It's not strictly a designation in planning law, but no wildland area mapping within the, the valley of of uh, within the Strath of Loch Hall. Uh, so just to um, clarify, if I'm understanding correctly, you're not against the expansion of the renewables um, industry, but it's the mapping that you're concerned about and the protection of the 
the scenic areas. I think I think it, it it would be foolish to deny that uh, renewables have a have a place within a mixed uh, economy. Uh, our concern is that the in the rush to facilitate onshore wind farms in particular, landscape is being unnecessarily uh, damaged uh, in some quite scenic and remote areas, uh, which depend on on nature and landscape tourism for their uh, for their livelihoods. So th I think it's the balance that is is wrong. We we wouldn't presume to come along here and and say, oh well, the renewables policy as a whole is is uh, is overinflated and and silly. I mean that that would be stupid of us to say that. Okay, thank you. Do you want to come in and supplement? Yeah, you thanks. Just, to ask another question at the same time. Okay, um, just picking up on on your your sweeping statement that suggests most wind farms are uh, approved. Is there not a case in your area uh, around Loch Awe where um, former MSP Jamie McGregor's uh, wind farm application was refused? Um, I think it's worth pointing out that uh, there have been refusals. Uh, yes, indeed, and, and I didn't make a sweeping statement that they were all or most of them uh, consented. Uh, the the consent rate in recent years has varied between uh, just over fifty percent and and seventy five percent. So you, you are quite right, of course, and I never for one moment implied that that all wind farms were consented. Okay, thanks um, for that. Um, you've mentioned uh, earlier uh, in your opening statement the SNH's um, wild land area mapping. Now, would you agree that much of the land, uh, much of the wild land area map, covers areas that were previously inhabited uh, before and after the clearances? This is an argument that has been going on for some time uh, in Parliament. So. Uh, yes, I think I have heard. Uh, um, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I'm qualified to uh, answer that uh, um, that one. But I, I'd like to come back on it um, uh, and uh, answer you. Well, if, if, if I could uh, assist you um, before you go any further. Um, uh, you mentioned that, uh, that the, the wild land area mapping by SNH wasn't sufficiently robust, uh, and I was just wondering if you could expand on that it, comment. It's, it, it goes back to the um, availability of base data on um, maybe on an increase in wind turbines specifically. Um, I did make some um, notes on, the, on this earlier, and so th this might address what you're um, um, asking. Um, although we've got a, a lot of in information available in the energy consents unit um, databases on wind energy capacity and in the Scottish Government Energy Statistics for Scotland series for those with the time and the knowledge to seek it out, it's not, it's not actually um, uh, very easy, and to compile it into useful form. It is usually in capacity terms, megawatts or gigawatts, often in um, inconsistent format and only understandable by cross-reference. Some of the data is reported as all renewables, whilst other sources aggregate on and offshore wind capacity, and yet others specify on and offshore wind capacity separately. Energy trend statistics, um, table um, 61C, it would be enormously helpful in our view if the Parliament were to ask the Scottish Government to publish regular updates on the number of wind turbines in Scotland at any particular time, as this um, is the key information necessary to understand the increasingly visual impact on tourist areas and the, the loss of SNH wind farm mapping, which stopped in um, 2013, needs to be urgently re-established as transparency on scale and numbers of de developments is currently missing for the ordinary citizen. It's very difficult for ordinary <coughs> people to get at that. May, may, may I add specifically on, on, on your question, sir, that uh, the, the, there are two issues that, that concern us. One is the uh, the wildland area mappings, 
uh, and we we know that this was undertaken in close collaboration with the Wildland Institute at the University of Leeds, and there was a, a rigorous enough methodology that was used to to identify the areas. Yes, you are quite right. In, in many of the wildland areas, there there are the ruins of old shillings. Uh, so your your starting point is is entirely correct in that. The uh, the townships and yes, oh, villages, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, so, so that certainly they're not, they're not, and never were uh, thought to be wilderness. They, they are wildland by the the definitions used by SNH. Uh, but the the second uh, concern is that there has been considerable development developer pressure, uh, both to to have uh, potential wildland areas. Uh, removed from the map uh, uh, before the the final publication of the wildland area map by SNH, um, and some of that was in an area that I know well in Rannoch. Um, the, the, there have been uh, actual uh, removals of wildland area mapping for Stronlerig to facilitate Stronlerig. Uh, and uh, again, there, there's a third area of concern, and that is the, the strength of protection that wildland areas offer against industrial development of all kinds, not, not just wind farms, although mostly wind farms. Um, the, 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 those are our concerns. The, the map itself uh, seems to us fairly robust. I, I'm actually a trustee of the John Muir Trust, and uh, the John Muir Trust uh, is concerned about the the third of those elements, not so much the the first. We we accept that with the input of the the Wildland Institute at the University of Leeds, the methodology of the mapping was was quite good. So just to clarify, you're saying that the the map is is sufficiently robust, but Mrs. Metcalf is saying it isn't. We, we're, we're here asking for a, a reconsideration of national scenic areas, not of the, the wildland uh, area map. That, that is an ancillary issue. Okay. Uh, essentially, we're here asking for national scenic areas to be reconsidered after 40 years of inaction. Uh, and certainly part of that reconsideration will be the input of the, uh, the expert uh, uh, advice from the the Wildland Institute and from SNH in drawing up the wildland area maps. Okay, thank you. Uh, Brian Quito. Uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, I'm actually just going to ask an ancillary an question, if that's okay, because I feel that uh, they've already answered the question I was going to ask. Um, I'm interested around, you discussed uh, or suggested a vulnerability around, around the law for, from an industrial development that's um, uh, too close. Uh, are, are we talking here uh, an impact on uh, water quality or, or water table here? Uh, certainly. Um, uh, the, 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 there is a, a water catchment area in um, North Loch Hall, um, but um, because of the geography of, uh, in fact, um, my colleague Alan, you might want to say more on this, but um, the geography of, of the loch, it is... Um, as we said, uh, it's the longest uh, freshwater loch in Scotland. And uh, um, industrial development, because it's so narrow, um, it, the, the impacts from industrial um, developments are um, twofold, because they can be very easily seen on both sides of the loch, whereas um, in other large lo lochs, um, they can be quite a distance away. Um, Alan, did you want to say anything? Well, you, you were asking about the water quality. Yeah. Um, so, uh, there is a, uh, a wind farm um, application going through at the moment, which is up a sonic and wind farm, and certainly issues of uh, possible um, pollution to the water quality of people who take their water from local burns. Um, that is an issue that is being considered and uh, will be... Uh, reported to and considered by the reporter on this particular wind farm. Um, certainly, I think from elsewhere, there have been issues with uh, water quality from disturbance by uh, wind farms being um, put in, in place 
once uh, they've been um, approved. So can I, if, if, that, if that's the case, I, mean, I, I was looking specifically around the loch, but if you're looking at um, burns uh, and, and feeder uh, uh, streams, etc. Mm -hmm. I mean, there has to be a, there has to be a, a, a limit to how far away we can, we can, we can, these industrial developments uh, can start. Um, I mean, you know, I mean, well, you, I mean, they will be within a watershed or a water catchment area, wherever they're placed. Um, so um, obviously, we're particularly concerned uh, coming. Um, other can kill chronic community council which is an area which borders uh, one part of um Lujo and uh, um, uh, within that so we're particularly concerned with, uh, with there but um it, it, if i can just um draw your attention to that it's not only wind farms we for instance um in the same, almost in the same footprint, SSE want to build, um, and they've had uh, um, exhibitions on this, and it, it will um, come to an application fairly soon, I think. Um, a huge um, substation, um, which will be in the order of 10 football pitches in, in area, and that is going to be adjacent to the Upper Sondkin wind farm. And the, the impact on um, the loch, on the water, from two um, uh, uh, developments of that, of that scale, we've got an S36 and the substation in the same area, um, they really, and this is what we have um, asked, uh, they should have an EIA, an environment impact uh, assessment for both um, because of the potential impact um, on the water and um, everything else. But that at the moment um, isn't, the, the cumulative impact isn't being addressed by uh, the Scottish Government and um, DB. EIS um, actually I insisting that there should be an environmental impact assessment for both. And I don't know uh, whether that is something that would be um, a first or whether this does has happened before. I don't know. Perhaps you know whether that does. I've got to be honest, I, I was under the impression that, that, that there was supposed to be uh, an environmental impact assessment. Yes, um, there, there will be, but, but stat what we're saying... A statutory one. Yeah. Yes, uh, but what, what we're saying is, at the moment, um, they're not being considered together. There, there isn't an okay. overarching um, EIA um, okay. for the two. That's just giving you an example okay. of the um, the type of impact um, that infrastructure and um, renewable um, energy developments can have on a, on a vulnerable area. It is vulnerable to the scale of, of, of developments um, because the loch is so narrow and that's our concern. Thanks, uh, Michelle Bounty. Right, thank you, thank you. Um, you've indicated that you have a lot of support for your petition from community sector and particularly for the local one with, from your, your local MSP, Mike Russell. Can you tell me about that support? Um, is it, have people just come forward and signed a petition or is there an active body of support? We had, before um, actually um, going down the road of um, constructing the position and, and lodging it, we had to ask our local communities what they thought, and 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 uh, you will see from the comments. I don't know whether you've you've actually looked at um, any of the comments that uh, were made in support of the. Um, a lot were from local people and and Scottish um, addresses, names and addresses. So yes, you know we had to um, pre lodging the. Um, the petition, we had to make sure that people were happy for it to go ahead. And did they come forward naturally, or were you having to, to go around and knock no. them up and...? <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we, um, we, we 
uh, invited people to our community council meeting and we talked about it um, uh, at some length, uh, didn't we, Alan? Um, I would say, actually, we, we were um, not, not as efficient as we might have been in, in trying to drum up support. Yes. For, and it just occurred no, no. naturally, yes. organically, um, yes. almost. Yeah. And, and your petition obviously has asked for a national review and looking at um, more scenic areas everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, are you aware of any other potential examples? I mean, obviously, Loch is where you, you're from and focusing on, but, you know, in terms of a, a wanting a review nationally, are you aware of any other areas that are oh, calling no. for this? Well, um, you would well, be I, a, 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 I, I, I am personally. <clears throat> uh, there, there are uh, areas around the, the Tummel and, and Rannoch, uh, a national scenic area where some extension would be would be uh, much appreciated um, and I'm sure there are other areas the the national scenic areas in their original conception were never intended to be static and that's really our key concern is the the lack of any uh, revision of the 13% of, of Scotland's area, which is national scenic areas. Circumstances have changed drastically over the last decade. The number of, of wind turbines in Scotland, just focusing on, on that, and because of the, the most uh, obvious uh, intrusion into, into natural landscapes, uh, has increased sixfold on the Scottish Government's own figures. From the, the time when the, the so-called Moffat study was undertaken, which uh, is the one that wind farm developers always rely on to say there is no impact of, uh, of uh, wind farms on tourist attractiveness. They always cite the Moffat study, which is now 10 years old, and was a study of visitors to, to built attractions, not to countryside. Uh, so I would say methodologically it was a shambles. Anyway, it's 10 years ago, and uh, the number of, of wind turbines in Scotland has increased sixfold in that decade, and the plans are to increase it considerably further. So our, our, concern, our central concern is the fixity of Scottish Government landscape conservation policy only relying on national scenic areas with this recent addendum of wildland areas which are of qualified protection and the dynamically changing uh, built environment in our wildest uh, and most scenic areas. That, that doesn't seem to fit. And, and it, it seems to us reasonable to ask that after 40 years, the national scenic areas are at least reconsidered uh, in number and also in their precise mapping. Do we have to ask another question? Okay, as, I mean, you're calling on an increase in NSAs for Scotland um, fundamentally, but, but when you were referring to the Ben Nevis one earlier and, and how it didn't cover its next door neighbour, Granite. Are you thinking that actually, as part of the review, they should look at the the area covered by the current and existing NSAs? Because I'm I'm conscious that one of the big issues is is when you put a hard border, yeah. what you get is an impact onto that NSA from sure. its surrounds. So, do you sure. envisage those expanding? Uh, yes, uh, perhaps in in some cases uh, even drawn back. You know where there has been development in in, in the the interim and those areas are no longer uh, worthy of, of being included in national scenic areas. Just a review would be good after 40 years uh, and, and the, the particular mapping of, of national scenic areas uh, as they currently exist uh, is, is, is one of the key things we'd like to, to, to have seen. Not necessarily always in creating new national scenic areas but adjusting the boundaries, uh, we would ideally like to see them increased to protect our increasingly rare, uh, uh, beautiful landscapes. And, and they are being impacted very considerably. As I say, the SNH map of the visibility of industrial structures shows that 73% of Scotland's land area was within sight of major industrial structures, and that was at 2013. Uh, SNH have not repeated that mapping, although other people have, to, to show the visual impact of the, this rapid development of uh, building in, the, in remote areas. Do you really see this as a, a blank page starting point? 
of re I, reviewing our I landscape. I see, a, I see a policy justification uh, for moving away from the static reliance for 40 years on, on a mapping that is long superseded. The realities have changed on the ground. Why aren't national scenic areas revisited, reconsidered in current circumstances? It was always envisaged when, when they were created that they would be a dynamic uh, and constantly reviewed thing. Uh, that has never happened, and, I, and really, it doesn't seem rational. Thank you. Helpful. Very much. I think we've um, covered a whole number of issues there. I suppose one thing I would maybe reflect on is that some of these remote depopulated areas that actually what you call industrial constructions are opportunities for communities to regenerate themselves and there's evidence of that in some of the you know communities across the islands and beyond and I wonder if you think I mean I hear what you say about NSAs and they should be maybe we should be looking at them again but is there an argument which says the focus on NSAs is, is actually an argument about the desirability or otherwise of wind farms and maybe we need and the impact of those that would be a different argument wouldn't it because it wouldn't just be about landscape, but with the people who have perhaps been over time had to move away from these landscapes because there wasn't work or sustainable communities. The, the uh, job creating aspects of wind farms are, are usually overstated by those who want to develop them. And they're, they're also, they tend to be temporary. Most of the structures are actually imported into, into Scotland uh, at the moment. Um, the, both the turbines, uh, the nasals and the, the towers are, are in the great majority fabricated abroad. Uh, so the, there is, as of yet, very little evidence that, uh, that there's construction employment. The, the knock-on um, from the construction period uh, is... Uh, is fairly modest if you if you look at the details of individual wind farms and the evidence that that has been submitted, the the numbers of of uh, of employees um, are not great typically, and they are specialists. They they will spend a couple of years building the the wind farm, but the permanent employment is uh, to specialist teams which tour the the area. They they do not bring in the main much in the way of, of local employment to these communities. Um, the, the evidence on uh, the, the major employment opportunity, which is tourism, the, the evidence is, is deeply problematic. Uh, Visit Scotland always asks for a, a tourism impact assessment to be made of every wind farm. To my knowledge, that has very rarely been done. The, the methodology that, that has been used to study this, this major employment generator, which is tourism, the methodologies so far have been uh, pretty poor. Uh, but two recent surveys by the Mountaineering, Sco Mountaineering Council of Scotland and the John Muir Trust itself uh, shows that there is a, an increasing tendency for potential tourists to say that they, they will not visit areas uh, where wind farms are developed. I know that's contentious. Uh, the, the industry itself disputes uh, whether that has any real impact. Uh, but certainly, the John Muir Trust recent uh, May of this year survey of declared intentions said that 55% of a random sample of over a 1,000 uh, Scots people, not not outdoor fanatics, just ordinary people. Uh, a, a random uh, uh, survey of over a thousand, fifty-five percent, they would be said they would be less likely to visit areas uh, where there were major industrial developments, including wind farms. Perhaps if they're described as major industrial developments, people have a different attitude to them than describe them as um, wind, wind. Are, uh, well, the, the Mountaineering Council for Scotland, uh, in, in a, a survey of its own members, and I, I accept these are people who are interested in landscape and mountains and the outdoors by definition, uh, they surveyed, uh, and it was conducted by YouGov in 2016, and uh, they found um, that 67% uh, of, of their own members said that they would be put off uh, visiting areas with wind farms specifically. That didn't include any other structures, which just wind farms. Okay. 
Can I thank you very much for that? I'm conscious we'll probably run over time slightly on this one. Um, so I thank you for your presentation and for answering our questions. I wonder if committee members um, have suggestions and options we might consider to take this petition forward. Brian? Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, of a particular interest in this because um, in my area, uh, when, in the southwest of Scotland, wind farms are rather prolific and my, my post bag is, 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 is full of from, from all sides to be fair and I think coming out of this and perhaps you could advise here uh, Kavina uh, what, I'm, what interests me is the, the environmental impact assessment and the way that's conducted uh, and because uh, it's not the first time I've, I've, I've heard that, that, that sometimes it's not taken in the round uh, and, the, and the sum of all parts are not taken into consideration. And I wonder if, 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 that, if, if an investigation into that from the uh, right into the government would pertain to this particular mm -hmm. petition. I think it would be worth contact the Scottish Government raising that question with them, asking them about why they're simply not reviewing national scenic areas. I mean, it's clear with respect to petitioners that they see this as an opportunity to open up the conversation about the impact of wind farms, but it's entirely legitimate at the same time to say are you not reviewing this because of your policy in wind farms? I think these are interesting issues to explore with them. And I think the Scottish Government in particular would be interested in their policy view on, you know, whether to extend or re, re kind of cast what the national scenic areas were, or is there an inhibition against that because it's going to be in conflict with policy around the re renewable energies? Is there anybody else we should be contacting, Michelle? I think the point here is that, that uh, as the gentleman said, it should be dynamic. I mean, it, you know, this is not about having a judgment about what the outcome would be. It's about saying perhaps we do need to revisit it and we need to look at it. And, and I think there is an argument for shrinking some as well, or maybe even removing some as well as in, you know, putting some in. Um, and certainly, you know, I, mentioned, I, I sat on planning for quite a long time and, and there, is, there are some complications around it as it stands. So I, I don't think there would be any harm in revisiting it and having a look at it. Mm. OK. Angus? Yes, thanks, convener. Um, if we are writing to the Scottish Government, just picking up on a point made by, by Christine Metcalf. Um, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but calling for regular updates to Parliament on the cumulative impact of wind farms uh, and a list of all the wind farms consented, uh, provided to, to members in Parliament. I think if we're writing to the government, we should ask for uh, that information. Okay. Local government do that. Certainly, Scottish Borders Council have, do have a mapping of all the wind farm um, yeah, construction so and, and both consented and constructed. There is, so, in, there is an interesting mm, question mm. at Scottish Government level or Scottish level mm. of a policy which says if it's an increase the number of national scenic mm. areas but you have a policy on renewable energy, do you end up having an accumulation of, of wind farms in areas where sadly the landscape is not beautiful and therefore you have mm. cumulative effect in some parts of Scotland that wouldn't, it can't be excluded and I think that's something I know, particularly in Ayrshire and other places, there's been some concern about the cumulative impact there mm -hmm. as well. But we may be straying too far, and I think we are agreeing to contact Scottish Government. Should we be writing to Scottish Natural Heritage as well? Yeah, because yeah. yeah. so. we need to ask them. Yeah. OK, any other suggestions? No? In that case, can I... Um, th consulted on it as well, because it's local authorities that sure. are dealing with planning on a daily basis, so mm -hmm. I think it would be perhaps, perhaps wise to ask local authorities' instance, opinion. Um, COSLA, mm -hmm. through COSLA, just yeah. something, is this something that they've looked at, and whether there's particular issues within COSLA mm -hmm. for particular areas? Can I, in that case, thank the witnesses very much for their attendance? Obviously, we will um, seek responses from the Scottish Government and others, and we'll come back to you once we get a response from them. And can I suspend the meeting briefly to allow for a changeover of witnesses? Thank you.
call the meeting back to order and can I indicate the next petition we're dealing with is petition 1657 on the proposal for the A77 to be upgraded. The petition was lodged by Donald McCain and can I welcome Finlay Carson, MSP, for this um, item on the agenda. The committee has received a written submission in relation to the petition from PO Ferries, which is included in our papers. Since the papers were published, the committee has received a further written submission from Dr Daniel Goodyear, which is available on the petition website. Unfortunately, Don McCarry is unable to attend today's meeting, but I'd like to welcome John Campbell and Willie Scobie, who are both A77 Action Group members. Can I invite you to provide a brief opening statement of no more than five minutes, after which we'll move to questions from committee members. Thank you. Thank you, Convener, and good morning to you and, and members of the committee. And could I take the opportunity and thank you for uh, accepting the petition and for the opportunity to hear uh, evidence that we want to uh, lead. Uh, as you can see, my name is Willis Coburn. I've got uh, John Campbell with us from Maybole, who is also a member of the Action Group. And as you say, uh, we have not got the petitioner with us. Uh, Donald had an accident with his knee, so he sends his apologies. Uh, the petition in itself, as you uh, have uh, recognised, had some 1,599 signatures, uh, uh, that was the online, and indeed it had a further 1,652 offline, which totaled 3,251 in the short period that uh, we were allocated to collect these, and uh, that seems a reasonable and good response uh, to the petition. It shows uh, that people are concerned about the A77, not only the condition, but uh, the fact that it is an arterial route. The petition uh, calls for the A77 to be upgraded to dual carriageway, and that's from Whitlow's Roundabout to the ferry ports of Cairn Ryan, and then there's a further extension from Cairn Ryan to, uh, towards Stranraer, again, that connects with the trunk road, the A75, the Euro route. I think, you know, in 2005, June 2000, 2005, there was also a petition, uh, then the PE859, that was presented to Parliament, to the Scottish Parliament by uh, West Sound, uh, Sheena Bothwick and, and Alan Gordon, the route director, Stena. And at that particular time, Stena were threatening to, to uh, move away altogether from Loch Ryan. Uh, but fortunately, they remained. And what they asked for was the improvements to the 70, 75 and 77. Uh, and fortunately, uh, both the 75 and the 77, we saw five places, uh, passing places installed. But at that time, we don't feel it went far enough. Uh, in terms of the upgrading of both roads. When we look at the investments uh, by both ferry companies, then we're talking about the region of £500 million, million pounds, uh, from both uh, major international ferry companies. But that investment was not matched by the investment on uh, the, the roads, both the 77 or the, the, the 75. And if you compare that with, with uh, other uh, ferry ports, both in Wales, the A55, there's some £0.5 billion pounds spent on, on that road to, to upgrade the dual carriageway. Again, on the link road to Haysham, £125 million pounds, uh, dual carriageway uh, and motorway uh, improvements. Uh, and if you look at the other side of the water, Northern Ireland side, and from Lan, Belfast, right down to Dublin, you've got motorway the, the, the whole way. So the A77 seems to be the one that has been neglected. Again, following the, the closure of Trun and Lan, and, and I think P&O have also submitted uh, evidence, uh, and that route closing, then there's been increased traffic uh, from Trun, uh, and uh, the A77, in fact, is the, uh, a link road, a, ma a major road to four major cities, so Edinburgh, Glasgow, Belfast, right down to Dublin. Uh, and it's essential that it serves the economic and social well-being of the area, 
but also uh, agriculture. And I think we've had the support of the NFU on, on the upgrade and all that. I draw your attention to in 2015, around one billion pound exports to Northern Ireland uh, and uh, the EU member state of the Republic Ireland uh, has been carried along the A77 again through the, the UK's third busiest passenger ferry uh, and gateway and freight hub. So I think that's important. Again, you know, in, in terms of the economy of the southwest of Scotland, it has areas of deprivation uh, and run-down areas, uh, which leads again to increased unemployment, uh, relies a lot on, on uh, state benefit. And we have a young people, uh, our generation, leaving the area. And what we've got to do is try and, and reboost the, the, the whole economy, both in Ayrshire and Dumfries and Galloway. We've noticed recently that there's been uh, an improvement uh, to the A737 Dalry bypass, which again is not dissimilar to the A77. Uh, and I'll let John, if you, if you don't mind, convener, to, to speak more in, in other areas. But, you know, we have not seen uh, that improvement to the A77 similar to the A737 at Dalry which has a lot less uh, economy, the, the, the ferry ports and so forth, and we just wonder why. Other aspects are the safety in terms of uh, road that is, fit, that is fit for purpose and uh, the demands of modern traffic, and the, the risk that the A77 poses on modern traffic, people who live alongside it, having 44-ton lorries constantly, 24 hours a day, passing by. And the, 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 not only the physical, physical, but the psychological impact that has on, on uh, the people of the area. Uh, we welcome the announcement uh, just of late from the, the Transport Minister, uh, Humsa Yousaf, in terms of the Maybol, Maybol Bypass, but it has been a long time in, in coming. Uh, we, we felt that it did not go far enough in terms of that it's not dual carriage, uh, it's not going to be a dual carriageway, uh, and again that's for cycleways, uh, electric uh, vehicle chargers and so forth, where we could have taken pride in what we were, we, uh, uh, the government were delivered. Another major safety concern uh, are the two landslips, both at Lendlefoot uh, and particularly uh, at Matchburn, uh, a kilometre north of, of Cairn Ryan. And only last week, uh, since January, did we see the removal of, of traffic lights. But in the Marchburn situation, that has been there for four years that people have had to, to suffer that. And we don't often see any work going on to, to uh, sort the, the, the landslide there. Uh, so, so we are seriously concerned uh, about that. Another uh, side of the safety is the section uh, close due to road collisions. And I think in 2016-17, there's been 21 road closures. And on a road closure, then we have diversions. And the diversion normally is uh, because there's no other route uh, south of Ballantrae is... Uh, the A714 from Newton Stewart to Garvin, which is definitely uh, not fit for purpose, and at times uh, heavy vehicles have to take to uh, the embankments because they can't pass each other on, on the, the, the road there. So, so that is a, a serious concern. Not only in terms of safety, but in economical terms, where road hauliers then have increased costs in, in transport costs and so forth, uh, fuel uh, and so forth. Can I say in, in conclusion, uh, convener, that we consider the southwest of Scotland needs a fit for purpose road uh, infrastructure. Uh, we feel that improvements would uh, certainly help bring regrowth to Ayrshire and the southwest of Scotland, again, helping make better successes of the events that take place. Uh, in the southwest of Scotland, such as the Scottish Air Show, uh, 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 
golf tournaments uh, and many other uh, events. But also, in terms of Stranraer, we, we want to see it as a tourist route because we are remapping as a destination spot, and A77 and indeed A75 are crucial to us. Uh, I mentioned about the, the 21 closures. Of those 21, uh, 11 uh, were for planned road works where it's not safe for, uh, to convoy. The, the traffic in, in, in that, so the road uh, has to be, the uh, traffic has to be diverted. One was for uh, weather due to flood, uh, flooding, and a further nine were due to road traffic accidents. Sadly, there were three uh, fatalities on, on those. You, you have referred to the submission by Dr. Daniel uh, Goodyear. Uh, and again, in terms of hospital and, and access to Glasgow uh, and the Medical Centre of Excellence in, in Glasgow from the southwest, then that is crucial. The A77 is crucial. I think it's referred to as the golden hour on someone that, that, that's facing heart attacks or whatever, and we need to get people there. Uh, uh, and at times, you know, there's the fear the road uh, is closed. So could I finish, uh, convener? On, on, on three points, and we would look uh, for, for the petition committee and the Scottish Government to, to immediately prioritise on the landslide at Marchburn, where it's far too long, and, and we would ask that that, that, it, uh, that be sorted uh, as a matter uh, of urgency, that, that, that the road be improved on resurfacing to, to deal with the potholes that is constantly appearing on social media, and then in the long term that we are looking for the upgrading of the A77 to dual carriageway status. Thank you very much for that. Um, if we now move to questions, I'm going to ask Finlay Carson to come in first because I understand you're unable to stay for the whole of this um, agenda item. So if you want to maybe ask a question first. Uh, thanks, Convener. I appreciate the, the opportunity to speak in uh, support of this petition. Uh, I'd also like to put on record my thanks for, for the committee to come down to Dumfries and Galloway uh, last week to, to consider evidence on the A75. The A75 and the A77 are, are very similar. Um, I think you'll appreciate that uh, Dumfries and Galloway isn't uh, particularly well connected when it comes to road infrastructure, uh, and the A77 and the A75 are absolutely crucial to the, the ongoing economic uh, sustainability of the area. Uh, I can only speak very briefly, unfortunately, but I want to highlight uh, what Willie has said, particularly about the, the traffic lights at Marchbank. Um, Brian Whittle and I will, will remember that uh, there was a transport summit in Dumfries, uh, probably I think it was last year, uh, where we had a personal commitment from Hamza Youssef uh, to, to look personally at uh, the issue with the, the traffic lights being there for such an extended period. Unfortunately, as happens in so many cases, all that happens is it's that request is passed on to Transport Scotland and we get the, the bog standard response. And I think the committee have experienced that in the past where uh, the, the buck seems, uh, seems to be uh, shifted. Um, I, I, I want to emphasise how important A77 is to Stranraer. Stranraer should be seen as a gateway to Scotland uh, with our ferry port, which is uh, one of the shortest, of the, the shortest sea route across to Northern Ireland. And I think that sea link has become even more important when uh, the U United Kingdom leaves uh, Europe. Um, it's, it's a town that has not seen the investment that it should have done uh, and under, we really need the A75 and the A77 uh, to be upgraded before we can expect anybody to invest in, in that corner of uh, 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 Scotland. Uh, what we really want is equity of spend. The A77 needs to be seen as a, a really important route, uh, and I think the evidence you'll receive from P&O and, and Stena will, rely, will, will indicate just how important it is when it comes to not only freight transport, but also the, the tourism, tourism industry. And the number of complaints we get when that route is closed, as, as Mr Scobie's already said, you know, 25, 30 times uh, recently, there's a huge outcry when people have uh, expected to take a, a, an hour's detour because there's no alternative routes. It's the A75 or the A77, uh, with, and if, if it's not that, it's, it's some uh, B-class road which are far from adequate to, to carry the sort of traffic that comes through Stranraer. So I would urge you to look at this uh, petition very seriously, not just in light of the, the road safety issues that we see on, on the A77, which is recognised as a, a dangerous route, the whole length, um, 
is, is designated as that. We can we know that because of the, the speed cameras, the average speed cameras that we get in some sections. So it's unlike a lot of routes in, in Scotland that the whole route's uh, designated as a, a, a dangerous route. So that alone should uh, hopefully indicate that we need some work to, to upgrade that. Uh, equity of, of spend in the southwest of Scotland would be very much welcome. I think it's what we deserve. Okay, thanks very much. I'm not Thank quite you. sure that qualifies as a question, but anyway. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, we will now move to questioning um, the witnesses. Um, can I ask Angus MacDonald to start? Okay, thanks. I'm just picking up on um, your submission and your opening statement. Um, you made reference to the amount of investment that's taken place uh, on the E77 relating to safety improvements. Um, now, one of the projects that you've already mentioned, uh, which is soon to begin, is the construction of the, the Maybold Bypass, which uh, I know the, the local member, um, uh, Kenny Gibson, has campaigned for uh, for some time, uh, amongst others. So to, to what extent do you uh, think that the bypass will address some of the concerns that you've, you've already raised in the petition? The, the, the Maybowl bypass is in Ayrshire, uh, and I live in Dumfries and Galloway in Stranraer, and, and we see Maybowl uh, as a crucial improvement. Uh, the, the, to uh, bypass my vault. It, it, it is a dangerous uh, uh, high, high street and, and, and very, very narrow. Uh, and if there are any accidents, then you're completely uh, cut off. Uh, so we do see the, the, the improvements to the bypass of Maybowl as crucial and will improve, uh, and we welcome that, as I said. Uh, but, you know, we, we would have much preferred to see uh, uh, it to dual carriageway standard. Yeah. Sure. Sorry. Uh, sorry, uh, Madam Convener. I've actually, uh, I was born and brought up in Maybowl. I was 33 years as a part-time firefighter in Maybowl, going to hundreds of crashes. Uh, I've been at dozens of fatalities up and down that road. Even though we're a part-time station, for many, many years, we're one of the busiest uh, stations of any kind anywhere in Scotland for crashes. We would go to, we'd more, we carried more equipment than what the full-time uh, appliances did because, and we were well experienced, we covered a large area, twice as much of the area for crashes than what we did for normal house fires. At one time, we went to five times more crashes than we did any house fires or any other serious fires. The town itself, the first time the bypass was pegged out was 1936 by a Mr Howie. That was apprentice uh, surveyor with Air County Council. And it was 1936 that they went to the farmers and asked to buy the land then. Uh, they've been, uh, the landowners will tell you that they've been four times since to buy the land again in uh, the 80s, the 90s, early 2000s. And the money was given to us and then taken away again at the last minute. The town of Maybowl, it's the very first place in the whole of Britain, I believe, where it's a trunk road, was made into a 20 mile an hour section because the road at the high street is so, so dangerous. In the last hundred years, there's four fatalities that I know about, and possibly maybe more, a lots of uh, serious injuries. We had a building collapse, total building collapse. The engineers have said for many, many years, some of the buildings are, uh, are the 1700s. There's other ones at the, the bottom castle, there's the top castle. It was the only high street in Scotland, the two castles at one time in the high street. Those, the oldest building, parts of it dates back to the 1400s, the sorry. And the other part, the other castle at the bottom of the high street, the Kennedys, it dates back to the 1500s. So it's so tight, that's when it was built, that's when that high street was built. It was built for horse and cart. That's where Robert Burns' mother and father met at the market there in a very, very small, narrow street. And it's now been used for 44 tonners, 40 foot long vehicles, brand new vehicles that are twice the size that they used to be even 20 years ago. And they're allowed to be that way as well. So they're only inches away. The nearest part of the, the road to the, the building is 36 inches in the pavement. There's two other parts just over uh, 36 inches wide on the pavements away from the buildings. And as I said, we had a total building collapse. The engineers have been saying for many, many years, because of the vibration, that's going to happen. Four o'clock one Sunday afternoon, uh, the father was in the house with his family, his wife and two children. He heard a loud crack. He shouted um, to get out of the house as quick as possible. They got out, and the eyewitnesses that we spoke to after everything was made safe, they said that... As the father was the last one out, the cloud of dust was actually following him out, and that was in the middle of the high street. 
So there's lots of there's an, a lorry jackknife, the, the traffic lights, and went right through the shop window, etc. There's lots of things have happened, but we've been promised and promised. I've spoke to many transport ministers over the years uh, down at Maybole that's come over in de the last few decades. Promised that uh, one actually said, I won't forget Maybole, we'll definitely get a bypass. And that's happened time and time again. The people of Maybole actually, they, they used to say they won't believe it until they see the diggers in. Now they're saying they actually they won't believe it until they're, they're driving along the road. And that's only one part of the A77 that's been ignored. So the first time, the, the gentleman that actually pegged out in 1936, in his retiral speech, is one of the, the top people for the uh, surveyors for Air County Council. His retiral speech said, I pegged it out, but it's still not built. Like, there's story after story about the Mabel bypass. So we don't actually, nobody in Mabel believes it's actually going to happen. It does look as if it's on the cards now, but you know, we'll, as you say, we'll have, we'll have to wait and see. Um, picking up on your point with regard to the proximity of heavy vehicles, HGVs, to uh, to, to housing, um, we, certainly last week when the committee was down looking at the, the A75, we, we saw a couple of villages where, where that's certainly the case. So I can imagine how bad it is in Mabel. Okay. Thanks. Uh, if we can maybe just, I'll allow you a, f a few moments at the end to maybe to, okay. to contribute, but I'm really keen we get through some of the questions we have as well. Uh, Brian? Thank you, Kavira. Can I, I need to declare an interest here in that uh, it is part of my uh, region and I've been working with the, the A77 upgrade committee and uh, it's um, uh, my fault sitting here. <laughs> I, uh, I encourage them to um, uh, submit a petition, um, mainly around the fact that uh, very early on, as, as Finley Carson has said, uh, there was a symposium down in the police uh, at uh, the Transport Minister Humza Yusuf uh, and, and John Swinney were at and uh, I have to be, if I'm brutally honest about it, uh, this has been on the, you know, on the agenda since then, and I have seen nothing really happen since then. So, <coughs> uh, it, and and obviously, the, the, the over the years, the size of the ferries have increased, the size of the lorries have increased, and this, the amount of traffic that's on the road has increased. And I drive that road uh, often, um, and it is uh, without doubt uh, one of the most dangerous roads um, in Scotland notwithstanding the fact that it's a main arterial route uh, down to down to Cairn Ryan. And if I can ask, with, with that in mind, we, we, we talked about the, the temporary traffic lights uh, that have been there for four years. Uh, perhaps you, you'd enlighten the, uh, the committee here to the number of times uh, that, that a ferry unloads and uh, a serious amount of traffic, something up to about 100 uh, lorries, I understand, and the impact that has at those temporary traffic lights. I think there's a, 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 some 20, 26 uh, in any day uh, of uh, ferry uh, ferries coming into Cairn Line, both at uh, with P&O and Stena, and uh, as it lands, it, it unloads some 110. It can unload 110 heavy vehicles, 44 tonners, uh, at any uh, sailing. Uh, and that's within a, a half hour stretch uh, of a turnaround. So that's 110 vehicles trying to uh, are accessing the A77 or the A75. Uh, and it has major impact on, on the temporary lights of maybe a mile uh, tailback to these traffic lights. Uh, and then you've got the, 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 the conditions thereafter of people then wanting to pass uh, convoys of heavy vehicles, and the, the, there are very few passing places. I know that I've referred to the improvements on it, but very few places to, to pass safely, and people take risks, so that increases uh, the, the safety of the road and, and people taking chances. Uh, just with that mild tailback, the, the, the convoy of traffic, uh, heavy vehicles and then cars trying to get by. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, Rona, Kai? Thank you, good morning. Um, in your um, submission, you talk about the um, the benefits of events such as the Golf Open at Troon and um, major events like that. So, do you think the action you're calling for would make, a greater, um, make the area a greater attraction for major events such as that? And what kind of impact would that have on the economy and communities? We'll try to promote the area, the south uh, west of Scotland, uh, uh, as a festival area, uh, uh, and the, the 
Scottish Air uh, show uh, is one of the examples that, that, that there is golf and we've got uh, Donald Trump, uh, the President of America, uh, owns uh, Turnberry now and, and, and it uh, was at one time that the Open was held there. So it, it is a, 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 an, a, an attraction to the area. But it does turn people off, and, and, and with the road closing, then a number of people, uh, you know, south of here just decided, no, I'm not going to go. So, so that has a major impact, not only in, in Dumfries and Galloway, but Ayrshire to the events and so forth, because it's a long trek. If you go from Newton, from Stranraer to Newton Stewart, and then over that uh, particular stretch of road, that, that in itself isn't very uh, good or, or not fit for purpose. So it has got a major impact. And again, as I said, Stranraer is trying to uh, remap itself as a destination spot. People, they come there on uh, the, the ferry, Stena moving up six, six miles up the road. So that it has had a uh, serious impact on the economy of Stranra. We need to, to uh, rebrand Stranra as a destination spot rather than being synonymous as a, as a ferry port. We need now to, to try and attract more and more tourists into Stranra, but the A77 is a turn-off. Thank you. Can I, sorry, can, can I just say about Tundra in particular? Uh, Turnbury, we believe now, is the number one golf course in the whole of Britain, and a lot of people want to play it. But the RNA, uh, in a few occasions, have indicated that they're not happy to give the, the Open Championship to Turnbury because of the roads. And, and they say, in particular, the, the road, um, the A77 from the Whitlitz Roundabout, where it stops being a, a dual carriageway. It was at Royal Troon, the Open was at Royal Troon last year. And uh, the independent report that came out in January reckoned that uh, that area alone made about uh, 110 million pound, and just by ha holding, uh, because it's not just the people that go there for the four days, it's a huge build-up for all the TV companies, media, and various things, and they are there for weeks setting everything all up, which is using all the local facilities, and that was 110 million pound just in that one close area, and if we could get the likes of Turnbury, Turnbury itself um, employs about 400 people part-time, uh, full-time, directly or indirectly. And uh, it's it's a huge facility. It it came very, very close at one stage. Uh, perhaps the, the main hotel itself closing down, and a lot of people don't know that because uh, a lot of people didn't want to go there for various reasons. Golf agents uh, stopped sending people down there because it was taking so long when there were Americans here for a week spending an absolute fortune in, in golf courses and buying closed golf courses from Scotland. And uh, they would spend a long time, so they would be driving around about Scotland, but they were stopped sending them down here because it was a waste of part of their holiday, travelling there, uh, taking longer so it was to get here. So it was a huge uh, part, uh, part of the economy down in that area, so it is. And then further south, all the different caravan sites and everything, there's hundreds of jobs down there, all because of the, the beautiful, beautiful scenery we have down there. But people come down once and then they don't want to come back. It's, it's easier for a Glasgow family to go to... Uh, Berwick and Tweed in the northeast of England. It's quicker than go down to Port Patrick, which sounds absolutely crazy. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, Michelle Ballantyne. Yes. Thank you. Um, as you're aware, the committee were down in Dumfries and Galloway last week um, to, to hear the petition, some of the evidence on the petition in the A75. Um, and it was mentioned that there had been this summit, and I think... Uh, Brian has also referred to this. Is there anything that was discussed at that summit that hasn't been mentioned so far that you'd like to highlight to the committee? I think there has been mentioned, and indeed I attended the summit, mm. uh, the, the 100 day summit that, that, that uh, Holmes have promised that he, he would hold. Uh, and again, uh, it's been mentioned that, that he, he made a personal uh, commitment to himself that, that, that he would get something done with that particular uh, landslide. That's It's just a catastrophe waiting to happen because of the landslide uh, to the top side and the bottom side, and it's really on the road that's holding the, the, the piece together. Uh, and again, there has been uh, no... Uh, movement that, that anyone has seen since that time uh, uh, and uh, I think what they're relying on is for the, the improvement uh, uh, of the road to be sorted on revenue funding uh, and it was four years ago 
that uh, Transev uh, attended a, a council meeting in Stranraer uh, uh, and laid out that it would be 20 years before they would actually finish that particular road on, on the maintenance budget. There has been no capital investment to, to uh, fix that road, uh, and in comparison, the A82, uh, rest and be thankful, the A9 on, on any uh, landslides, it was done in a matter of days and week, uh, a few weeks, four years. Uh, I think they built the, the new bridge in six, uh, and we've had a landslide four and more years coming on to now. So in terms of, you know, he said he would look at the economy, uh, he, he, he took on board uh, the, the points that were well made at the summit, uh, but there has been no improvement since. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that. I wonder if there are any final points you want to highlight that we have. Could I just say one point to, you want to make yeah, it? Yeah, and, and it was the question made by uh, a question uh, posed by Angus Macdonald in terms of the May Bowl bypass, and uh, uh, while we welcome that, and I think it's uh, essential in terms of May Bowl that we have that bypass. If you take the forty-seven mile stretch from Whitlets to to Stranraer, uh, there are eight uh, towns and villages that you have to pass through uh, in, in that stretch, the 47-mile stretch. Uh, and I uh, heard you say that, you, well, I know you were in Dumfries and Galloway travelling up the A75, and you passed through two villages. Well, if you, you, if you travelled north, uh, and no doubt you did on the way home, you actually go through eight towns and villages. I don't know how many roundabouts, uh, restrictions on the road and 30 miles uh, and so forth and if you take the whole of Scotland uh, and John uh, has the map here and, and can evidence it then there are very few of any other uh, major trunk roads where you pass through any towns and villages they're all bypassed the, the, the A77 have, uh, has eight towns and villages uh, which far exceed the whole of Scotland and it's almost like the, the, the forgotten corner in terms of uh, investment in, in, in the infrastructure, the uh, arterial routes, and the, the, the trunk roads of the 77 and the 75. Okay. I've got a map that I take to different meetings. I've been asked from Newton Stewart to Stranraer all the way up to Ayr to about a dozen meetings since, since February. And on the map, it shows you the distance that you can travel without going through another 30 mile an hour limit. And if you wouldn't mind if I could get permission to show you for one minute on the, the map of Scotland, the different road systems going north and going south, if, if that would I'm be... I'm wondering if it's possible to find some way of sharing that information with the committee afterwards. Yes. We're just simply conscious of, mm -hmm. of time and the practicalities of, all, okay. of us seeing that. So perhaps speak to the clerks when we um, finish this session mm -hmm. and you can find a way of us seeing that. But I can uh, thank you very much for your evidence. I think you make a very interesting and, and very substantial case around the economic, environmental and safety issues that you've highlighted. Um, and it's something I think the whole committee has um, found very interesting and, and thought-provoking. I don't know what action, however, we would want to take as a consequence. Well, <laughs> I think, uh, as I said, it's, it's been mentioned, it's, it's in danger, they say it's the forgotten part of, of, of Scotland. I think it's in danger of becoming the ignored part, part of Scotland because it's, it's no longer a... It's no longer, no longer a secret that there's an issue here, and I think I have struggled to uh, get some sort of, of uh, cohesive response uh, from the government in writing to them on several occasions around a longer-term strategy of, of what we do with the 77 and the 75. And I think, given given the uh, uh, the seriousness of this issue and, and the, the reality of this, speaking to the very poor owners of a, a, a real possibility. Of that route being, uh, of them taking the route from Dublin to Holyhead, because I think that there's now only a 20 minute difference getting from Belfast to Birmingham as uh, through Holyhead than it is through uh, through Stranraer. And if we don't do something about it, we, we, we're in danger of losing the port. I, I would ask the committee uh, uh, that we bring the, the, the hum to use of the Transport Minister uh, to the committee and, and uh, allow us to. Uh, tease out what the what the government's plans are for that part of the the, the world because I think it's 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 uh, of real seriousness. Okay. Any other views, Michelle? Um, 
Obviously, the A77 and the A75, they're, they're pretty much the same arguments with some differences. And I'm, I'm wondering about how we link these together, um, because the, I know they're two separate petitions, but, but it's the same economic arguments, it's the same issues around um, actually the ports, the movement of traffic. And I'm wondering whether we should be hearing those together, because it feels to me like there's a, if there was to be an upgrade, then there may be a decision about prioritisation, et cetera. So, you know, I, um, I feel that I'd like them to be tighter. Sense that we, mm -hmm. If we were going to get evidence from the <coughs> Scottish Government Minister, yeah. then that, it would make sense for us to put the two of them together. And I don't think anybody have any objections to that because it is around environment, economy and, and mm -hmm. safety issues. My only question would be whether it's actually, you know, it is beyond the transport sector because there's a decision of Cabinet. It's going to be about the economy as well as simply um, transport issues. But that is something perhaps we can raise with... Scottish Government itself, who would be the most appropriate person to come to committee? I don't know if there are other views on that. I think this is a new petition, although it's a very long-running um, saga. Um, I think initially we should be writing to the government and um, you know, getting their views on this particular petition, and then, as Michelle says, perhaps linking the two yeah. for evidence. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I certainly should be writing to the Scottish Government. It would be our expectation that the government would be. Ideally, I think, in my view, the Cabinet Secretary coming to talk about both these issues and round how they then address that in terms of the economy of the area. Because I think the points made about the threat to the port is quite significant and then other developments around that. Um, particularly about their engagement with the ports, because speaking to, to the um, shipping lines last week, I, th I think there's some very important economic discussions um, and particularly about the impact going forward. OK. OK, so we will write to, to the Scottish Government, raise these issues. There may be the very specific questions about the timetable for the Mayball Bypass and the commitment that, that has been already mentioned, the arms and use of made, which now sits with Transport Scotland. So very simple things we can ask, but the bigger picture questions are highlighted by both petitions, I think, around the impact on the local communities, what's the long-term plan and a recognition of the economic consequences of not doing anything. I say, um, uh, can we just just to uh, go back to inviting the, the, the cabinet secretary here? Is what will happen is we'll write to the government and we'll get that reply back, and then we're going to ask the cabinet secretary to come in. I think what we do is I think what we do is we write in relation to the petition and ask for a written response <laughs> with a view to them coming yeah. to committee beyond that. I think that's it's not to delay it, but we would expect that whenever we schedule the session with the whoever the government minister is, they will have already provided written evidence, which would also afford the opportunity for the petitioners to respond ahead of our um, session with the government minister. I presume they would need to support anyway for any any suggestions going forward. You know, so he'd have to be on board and briefed anyway. Yeah. Mm. OK. In that case, if I can thank you very much for your attendance. Um, I appreciate very much uh, your being here. And we will also keep in touch with you in terms of where we are with a government response and with any scheduling of future consideration of the petition. And with that, can I suspend the meeting briefly to allow for the change of witnesses?
to order. Um, the next petition for consideration is Petition 1662 on improving treatment for patients with Lyme disease and associated tick-borne diseases. This petition was lodged jointly by Janie Kringian and Lorraine Murray. Can I welcome Alexander Burnett, MSP, who led the Members to Business debate on this issue earlier this year. Can I welcome both Janie and Lorraine to the meeting and thank you very much for attending today. You have the opportunity now to provide a brief opening statement of up to five minutes, after which we will move to questions from the committee. We can ask you to make your statement now. Thank you very much for inviting us here to discuss improving treatment for patients with Lyme disease and associated tick-borne diseases. Lyme disease is an infection passed to humans by the bite of a tick. It's caused by bacteria known as Borrelia. The best known species is Borrelia burgdorferi, but multiple species exist, of which at least five are prevalent in Scotland. Typical initial symptoms of Lyme disease are a bullseye rash and flu-like illness. More serious symptoms may develop weeks, months or even years later if Lyme disease is left untreated. Later symptoms include joint pain and swelling, headaches, extreme fatigue and problems affecting the nervous system, heart, membranes surrounding the brain and spinal cord. If infection is caught early, most patients recover with standard treatment. However, 10 to 20% of patients go on to develop a debilitating chronic illness. On average, 5% of ticks in Scotland are infected with Borrelia. In 1996, there were fewer than 30 laboratory confirmed cases in Scottish patients, but by 2014, there were around 230. However, the numbers are likely to be much higher because GPs estimate that only 20 to 40% of cases are referred Lyme disease is not notifiable, and so nobody really knows. However, tests in donated blood have concluded that 4.2% of Scottish blood donors have positive Borrelia serology. That equates to 225,000 people having been infected, although not everyone who's infected has current symptoms. The prevalence of positive serology was even higher in the Highlands, with 8.6% infection around Inverness. Earlier this year, Alexander Burnett, who's here today, submitted a Scottish Parliament motion on Lyme disease, the need to do more. In June, in a Holyrood debate on the motion, Liam Kerr, MSP, stated that Lyme disease is expected to reach epidemic levels by 2028. There are numerous issues with testing and diagnosis. A patient may not remember a tick bite. Nymph ticks are the size of a poppy seed and so easily missed. There may not be a bullseye rash. In a recent Scottish study, only 48% of patients had such a rash. Testing is unreliable. In a recent analysis of test kits, it was found that Lyme disease generated over 500 times more false negative results than HIV testing. In addition, immune response has been found to be undulatory, and so test results can be negative during infection. And there are no tests for two of the five species found in Scotland. And ticks can transmit multiple infections from a single bite. Co-infections have been found to in increase the length and severity of illness, and there are no tests which cover all species of such co-infections. Given the unreliability of testing, it's very easy for Lyme disease and its related co-infections to be misdiagnosed. And there are issues with treatment. There are a huge number of uncertainties in the treatment of Lyme disease. However, there have now been over 700 peer-reviewed papers demonstrating persistence of Borrelia after antibiotic treatment. As Dr. Berkowitz, a Lyme disease consultant who spoke in Holyrood in June, stated, there is now a mountain of good and indisputable scientific evidence that Lyme disease and its co-infections can become persistent and that various organisms have survival techniques to survive and even thrive through courses of antibiotics. In fact, Borrelia has been found to be one of the most complex bacteria known to man. Treatment of Lyme disease in Scotland has used guidelines developed by the Infectious Diseases Society of America, or ITSA. These guidelines were developed in 2006, before the recent medical understanding of the complexities of Borrelia and persistence. They have been removed from the US National Guidelines Clearinghouse because they are now considered too out of date, and ITSA have not produced more recent guidelines. 
The British Infection Association issued a position paper in 2011. In it, they support the IDSA point of view, stating that a diagnosis of chronic Lyme disease should not be made without clinical or laboratory evidence. Without reliable tests for Lyme disease and co-infections, there is no evidence to allow patients to get treated appropriately. Abandoned by NHS Scotland, many patients, including ourselves, seek private treatment abroad. So, what needs to be done? Firstly, improve testing. Provide a test which does not rely on antibodies. A commercial Lyme antigen test which does not depend on the presence of antibodies and is described as a game-changing tool for Lyme disease diagnosis is now available in Europe but not yet available to Scottish patients. And provide more testing for all Borrelia species and co-infections. Secondly, improve treatment. Provide better guidelines. Guidelines are needed which acknowledge the recent research showing that Lyme bacteria can persist through courses of antibiotics. NICE has been asked by NHS England to develop guidance on the diagnosis and management of Lyme disease. This is expected to be published next year. If these guidelines do not acknowledge persistence, then Scotland should develop our own and establish a specialist treatment centre. We want a Scottish vector-borne illness treatment centre to be established to deal with complex cases involving a multidisciplinary team of specialists in infectious diseases, immunology, functional medicine and nutrition, and provide resources for research and development into the treatment of chronic tick-borne infections in Scotland. And thirdly, improve education Teach consultants, GPs and medical students to ensure they're fully up to date on the persistence of Borrelia and co-infections and the complexity of treatment. And teach the public to ensure that they understand the dangers and how to protect themselves. We want to see landowners being required to display suitable warning notices at, for example, visitor centres and car parks. We call on the medical and political leaders in Scotland to follow France's example in ensuring that the recent acknowledgement of the complexities of Lyme disease is followed by a change of policy regarding treatment and that more resources are put into tackling a condition which is increasing in prevalence, has a great danger of negatively affecting the tourist industry and is placing a burden on the wider economy of Scotland. If Lyme disease is going to reach epidemic levels by 2028, now is the time to act. Thank you very much for that, Nat, and I appreciate um, that it's something very personal to you and therefore it, it's ever more powerful in terms of the evidence that you've given. Can I ask you, though, in your petition, you state that you've written a report for discussion with the Chief Medical Officer and you also met with Healthcare Improvement Scotland. I wonder what outcomes or feedback you've received from these discussions? I got a letter back from the Chief Medical Officer um, who um, agreed with many of the points that I was making, but didn't um, commit to any any change. Um, I had a meeting with uh, Dame Denise Coya, uh, and um, she um, was very supportive of of what I was telling her, um, and has continued to keep in touch. But there have been no specific commitments There's made. There's been no course action course. at the moment. In, in well, that's not the case. Dame Denise Coya has met with lots of people and has um, been uh, involved in discussions, I believe. OK, thank you very much for that. Uh, Brian Whittle. Um, thank you, Vera, and thank you. Good morning. Thank you very much for your, for your evidence. I have to say a little bit of, um, uh, personal about this as well, because I know that one of, one of the athletes down the track uh, contracted Lyme disease, and uh, that was actually down to, apparently, the grass not being cut off enough down, down, at, the, uh, down at the stadium. So... Um, I, I have a little bit of understanding of, of this particular issue. And you said there are numerous issues with testing, and if I could explore that with you, uh, if I may. You've quoted Lyme Disease Action as saying there are no conclusive tests uh, currently uh, in use in the UK that will accurately diagnose Lyme disease or distinguish from past infection. Um, are you aware of other countries that do have this? I know you've kind of alluded to that before, but other countries that do have these tests? Um, a lot of the, the tests that are there, don't, just don't, there are no markers of active infection for Borrelia, and that, that's part of the problem. Um, th this new Lyme antigen test may prove, prove to be um, 
the thing which changes that, um, but I think it's too early to know. Okay, uh, can I ask a supplementary? Uh, can I just add to this? Um, there is actually another test out there called the LTT Melissa test, uh, which they are using on people that are not um, being picked up with the, the blood test. And the way that works is um, the conventional laboratory diagnosis involves demonstration of Borrelia antibodies in ELISA, followed by confirmation of positive results in Western blot. However, due to cross-reactivity with antigenically related microorganisms, Epstein-Barr viruses, things like that, delayed or failed antibody production or IgM resistance, serological diagnosis alone is often ambiguous. And this is where this LTT comes into place. It's uh, called a memory lymphocyte simula simulation assay, and it differs from the ELISA in the Western blot because the foreign antigen part of the Lyme bacterium is added to the patient's blood and the de degree of lymphocytic reaction is measured from this. So they actually add the bacteria and if there is a response with the memory cells, that's how they detect it. Okay. I think that test is used in Germany. And it's used in Germany and also the United States, some places there. Is there, is, is there a, a reports on the success rate? Do we have? We, uh, yeah. I'm not aware of the statistics, but I'm sure they, they will be out there. Okay. There's certainly um, all the people that are coming back negative with the, the you know, expecting an, uh, an immune response um, are being picked up with this other test okay. because they more focus on your memory cells rather than relying on the antibodies. Because what you have to realise is Lyme disease and all these different co-infections you get actually suppress your immune system. So that's what the test is based on. Uh, and you've, ident you've identified some other issues there, including cost and the lack of sensitivity of tests and the difficulties this creates in terms of being used in the market for treatment response. The briefing that has been prepared for us refers to the online guidance which identifies the possibility of false positive results. Well, a number of comments received on the petition mentioned false negatives. I, I, I wonder if you've, you could comment on that. There is a lot of controversy in the area of Lyme disease and so you'll, you'll read different things from different places. Um, but um, there are different definitions of Lyme disease. Lyme disease can be thought of as being caused by Borrelia burgdorferi, um, but there are multiple species. And so um, we need tests which will cover the whole range of, of, of infections. And when people are talking about Lyme disease and they're sp specifically thinking about Borrelia burgdorferi, there is more information, there are more uh, um, tests, and and there is more research having been done. Um, but But patients need more than that, because there are at least five species in Scotland, two of which there are no tests for at all. And so um, it's so easy to get a false um, negative because they're not testing for the species that you happen to be, uh, to, you happen to be infected with. And this is what's happened to, what happened to me. Um, I was um, first tested in 2007 and told that I had a high level of antibodies, but they didn't know what, what, what it was. And I was um, given a clinical diagnosis of Lyme disease at the Western General here in Edinburgh. Um, I had three years of treatment. And then um, at the end of the three years, they said, um, you, um, you've, you've had the treatment. Um, you've no doubt had Lyme disease, um, but there's nothing more we can do for you. And so you're just charged. At that point, I was really seriously still ill and went for private treatment. And it was... Um, four years later, when I had a positive test for Borrelia guarinii, um, and um, I then later found out that the original test that I was was having in the in the um, hospital in Edinburgh um, never tested for Borrelia guarinii. Um, it wasn't part of the of the test which took place at that time, and therefore I had. Um, from the point of of bite until the, until I got an actual. Um, test result that, that, that came out with anything um, was 10 years. And in that time, uh, I had become too ill to, to recover. Thank you. Michelle, you wanted, a, sorry, you wanted a brief supplementary, Michelle? Yeah. I just Clarification. Are, are you saying that the LTT test 
can actually, on, on a retest of the false negatives, will pick up all the the elements of Borrelia, including the two that we can't currently test for. We're not experts in the medical side of things, but many patients are being um, diagnosed using the, the LTT Melissa test, where in uh, when they're tested in the UK, they, 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 they're not being given a diagnosis. They're, 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 they're not given a diagnosis, and therefore they don't get treatment. And they then go abroad to get treatment, to try and get to get an answer to what's wrong. And in using this test, they get, they get um, an answer. It may not be the full answer. But, but what it will presumably say, because the, the increased activity in that memory recognition will tell them there's something going on, but not necessarily the form of Borrelia that's present. Well, it depends it, on the Borrelia that's been added to the test. Right. Um, and obviously, they, they have about 20 different strains. Obviously, they use the most common European strains. Uh, and, so um, and they also test for co-infections as well, like Babesia, which is a parasite. Yeah. I've actually got that, which I got from a tick. Um, and the NHS in this country didn't, couldn't test for it. There are many tests that don't that are not available here. Um, I believe I may have also been infected with um, Bartonella at the same time in, in the tick bite, and um, I've asked for Bartonella testing to be done and been told that there are no Bartonella tests done in Scotland now. And I've also um, there are multiple species of of Babesia, and um, I've only been tested for one of them. Can I ask if you have an understanding of whether there's a consistency of testing across Scotland? I mean, clearly you're saying there are some tests that are not available in Scotland, but is it different within Scotland? Or would you know I, that? No, I believe it's consistent. that's consistent throughout Scotland. Okay, okay thank you. Um, Rona Mackay? Thank you. Good morning. Um, can I move on uh, to discuss treatment? Um, you say in your petition that the current guidelines used um, in Scotland were developed in America in 2006 and are now considered out of date in America. So I wonder if you could expand on your concerns about that and um, you know what, what they are, basically what the guidelines are and why you're concerned that they'll be out of date here too. The guidelines used in, in the UK uh, recommend two to four weeks of antibiotic treatment. Um, and in some cases, they recommend that you have intravenous antibiotic treatment, but mostly it's oral. Um, so, so how does that compare with the Ameri the ones published in America? That are, you is that the same? That's the the, 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 the those, so those using, guide, using the guidelines those, being right. used here are based on the out of date guidelines from the states. Right. Um, okay. But many doctors in this in, in particularly in the US um, believe that long term treatment is necessary to treat Lyme, and that it must right. be much much more aggressively treated because of the persistence. Yeah. And, and the so tendency here is to stick to those 2006 guidelines? Very much so, yeah. yes. Okay. yes. But the research has moved on since then. They're, they're discovering that the Borrelia bacteria is a very clever bacteria. It can go into biofilms, it can go into cis form. So they've discovered that a multi-antibiotic approach to cover all the co-infections as well that's been found is getting people well. And it's not a quick treatment. This is done over years. So what would your sort of preferred options be for treatment? You know, if, if if you could say, right, you know, this is how we would change it, what would you prefer to have done? I would love them just to go with the research that's already out there. Um, uh -huh. There's a doctor called Dr Horowitz uh -huh. um, from New York. He's actually gone as far as uh, writing and designing symptom checklists uh -huh. for patients and doctors. Um, and from that, he can narrow down the chances of, for instance, you having the co-infection Babesia along with the Borrelia bacteria that cause Lyme disease uh, purely by symptoms. And with that, that determines what medication each person has. That, that's the way they work. So they go, yeah. they actually yeah. don't really focus on tests right. because they're so up to date um, with mm -hmm. the symptoms that cause yeah. and, and the progression of the different bacterial infections or parasites. Uh -huh. and, and are there any specialists in Scotland that you know of? No. No, I'm no. not aware of any. Well, um, in terms of testing, um, th um, Roger Evans at Rig Moore mm. um, has been involved in, mm. in, in a, uh, a lot of the, the test uh -huh. um, when it side comes of things, treatment, but treat treatment, If no. you're diagnosed, there's, there's no top, you know, six people or one, any, anybody that um, might be 
um, called in for anything? We don't know of, we as patients yeah. don't know of anyone who has um, been um, helped significantly by, by A particular care person. in Scotland. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay, thank can you. Can I um, just make you aware of what actually happens to us patients? Uh, well, basically, uh, these are the ones that might not have noticed the tick or the bullseye rash. They might not have even developed the rash that might have alerted them to the fact they were past the bacteria. Uh, they go to their local doctors, um, and they've actually been missed, obviously, from the doctors because they're not aware of the symptoms. And they're not familiar with the progression of the way Lyme disease um, might, and might, might never have seen a case before. Uh, these patients, like myself, was diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, so every single symptom I had was, was, was obviously brushed under that. Now, these patients sometimes never mount an antibody response to the current test, especially if they've been left years, as their bodies are so overwhelmed by all the infections Ironically, Lyme disease causes immune suppression, so it's no res surprise, really, that there is no response. So these people without positive tests or adequate treatment are left seriously ill and often moved about the NHS system without an accurate do diagnosis. They must be passed through infectious disease specialists but will be denied for their treatment as they haven't tested positive. What is more alarming is the fact that these patients have all the classic symptoms and the progression of Lyme disease. Unfortunately, they are denied treatment because the NHS relies on outdated guidelines and limited tests. And the symptoms, I mean, they're just completely ignored. Can I just, sorry, just interrupt there for a moment. If, if you went to the doctor and said, look, I, I feel dreadful and I actually was bitten by a tick, mm -hmm. Would that obviously spark off get you getting sent for immediate treatment, or you know, uh, it's up to you to say. Or I mean, if you went in with those symptoms, they wouldn't necessarily suspect that it was Lyme disease. It might be slightly different now than when when I, when I first um, got bitten. But I got bitten in two thousand and four. I know the exact date I got bitten. Yeah. I went to the doctor with a rash and initial flu-like illness. Yeah. And the GP that I saw at the time. The first thing he said was, have you been anywhere in America where you could have got Lyme disease? Right. But he didn't believe that you could get it in Britain. Oh, right, OK. And so... And were you I... aware that you had been bitten yes. at that point? Uh -huh. Yes. And okay. so um, that, that opportunity for treatment was completely missed. OK. OK. So and so, uh, you know, there are people who um, are... They may not have understood that they've been bitten. They may not have had a bullseye, bullseye rash, and so they've got even less chance, chance of being picked up. Of it being yeah. picked up yeah. than it did with us. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, um, Michelle Valentine. Yeah. Um, following on from the issue of treatment, you've indicated that you'd like to see the establishment of a Scot Scottish vector-borne illness set treatment centre um, with a multidisciplinary team, multidisciplinary team in place. Can you sort of expand on this suggestion and tell us what it is you'd like to see? Because you've, you've obviously already indicated that there's a, a lack of specialists on Lyme disease, so we'd be starting from quite a, a low point, I suppose. Um, well, with Lyme disease, it's a, it's a multi-systemic illness, mm -hmm. and so it, it, it has all sorts of implications. Um, and we feel that infectious diseases, although you know, that there is an element of that, that there, that... that Th that specialty is not sufficient to cover the whole range of things which happen. Um, the, the, these infections can um, modulate the, the biochemical mechanisms which um, occur in the body um, and therefore need functional um, medicine uh, specialists in order to be able to understand that. Um, for instance, you might need um, supplementation with, with um, vitamins or, and, and other um, supplements in order to be able to compensate for those sort of things which happen. Um, th th there are um, nutritional aspects of things um, which uh, come about. Um, the Lyme disease for me um, caused a complete intolerance to gluten's, gluten and I've had to modify my diet significantly in order to stay stable. Um, and so um, it would be really helpful to have specialists who could... Who could um, cover that side of things. Um, that it, We don't believe that any one specialty has enough 
enough if you if you're focusing on a specialty you're not focusing on the complete whole of that person and because it's multi-systemic and because it has so many consequences and um, we believe it would be much better uh, treated with with multiple specialties and that's what patients are getting when they go abroad for treatment they get um organisations which are geared up to, to having multiple specialties looking after their patients. And have you had much support, I mean, through your journey, because you've obviously been um, seeing a lot of people over a long period of time, have you had much support from the medical profession at your sort of operational level in terms of some of these suggestions, or have they come from yourself? There's been... There is, well, there, there is no support for some someone like us out there that's been affected by Lyme disease. If you don't get better from a couple of weeks' antibiotics that you're offered, you're basically just left on the shelf, seriously ill. I was just asked in 2010 by um, the Western General here and told they could do no more for me. I asked for a second opinion from Glasgow and they refused to see me because I'd never had a positive test. <coughs> My GP then decided that because two consultants had said that they wouldn't help, that he would not help either. And so f between 2010 and about two years ago, I had no help at all from the NHS. And that was from the Infectious Diseases That was from the Infectious, the Western. infectious yeah. Diseases, it was from my GP. Um, I felt completely abandoned with no help at all. I've gone for private help and, 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 and I've survived with that. And the model you're talking about, does that exist in other countries? Yes, it exists in America um, privately um, mm -hmm. and um, France has a national plan uh, for Lyme disease and is setting up specialist treatment centres throughout France. Uh, and so they have, they have that model um, in, in mind, if not, in, in, if not fully implemented. Thank you. Thanks, MacDonald. OK, um, thanks, Camille. Firstly, I'd like to uh, thank Jenny and, and Lorraine for bringing this petition uh, uh, to us. I, I had thought uh, until now that a Lyme disease test had been fairly straightforward, uh, and having had a number of uh, tick bites myself over the years, it's, be, it's actually been on my to-do list uh, to have the test. However, I didn't realise it was uh, far from straightforward. Um, the, the final aspect of your petition relates to education and, and public awareness. Um, so in terms of education, what roles within the medical profession do you feel would benefit from, from education? And do you have any thoughts on who might deliver the relevant education? Um, I think it's and, and also how it would be delivered. I think the need for education is at every level. Um, a lot of the barriers that patients are finding is when we... Um, reach the consultants that they are following the guidelines and therefore um, they're then we're then being abandoned because the guidelines are, are being followed and then and then we just drop off the end of the of the, of, of the treatment and so um, we would like to see a specialist treatment center being set up which would involve um, consultants going to um, work with doctors um, who believe in the persistence of chronic Lyme disease and would therefore they would therefore learn from them and then other consultants within Scotland could then learn from the specialist treatment centre and um, there's also a need for GPs to be um, brought up to date with the treatment and um, clearly as medical students come through um, that needs to be considered as well. Can I just add to the list um, for GPs I think a, a really good idea that could be ruled out immediately would be to have the symptom list and the progression of Lyme disease um, and from that it's like a multi-systemic infectious table that's already out there. From that they can immediately see that the patient's been sick for a few years that have not been picked up if they'd be likely to be suffering from Lyme disease regardless that the tests came back negative. Something like, something like that could be rolled out to all the doctors within the National Health Service. There is yeah. some training already out there. Um, Lyme Disease Action produced some, some training in, connect, in conjunction with the Royal College of General Practitioners. And so the, there is an online training course available and, and it, it's um, included as part of their um, continuing professional development um, element of their training. Um, but the last I heard, only 3% of general practitioners had actually taken that training. And it doesn't really alert and it's, to all the symptoms of Lyme disease. And it's also somewhat out of date now. Yeah. 
And of course, you also have the issue of uh, urban GPs maybe not being as aware of it as uh, as uh, yes, GPs it's my in, in rural areas. It's my understanding that a lot of the GPs in the Highlands are much better educated than elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, um, you, you'll also be aware that there's been um, significant or some media interest uh, with regard to coverage of Lyme disease recently. Um, and that includes support uh, for your petition from gamekeepers and moorland managers. Are you encouraged by that? Yes, yes. OK. Um, we've had a lot of, um, of mention of support, um, if not publicly, at least privately. Um, and there have been a number of bodies who've, who've, who've um, been in touch and, and um, said that they're prepared to support. OK, and, and what other initiatives or stakeholders' involvement can, can you see raising awareness out there? We would even like to go as far as uh, national um, trust services, you know, like um, monuments and things that are in, out in the country. We would really like it. Awareness rolled out everywhere, if possible, especially Lake District. I, I believe there's now leaflets there, but as someone else that's suffering from Lyme disease putting the leaflets there, you know, there's, a, there's just not much information out there for the public. The, the leaflet's been funded privately, it hasn't been? Yeah, from the charities, Lyme Disease Action, you know, we, we ring them up and say, can we have some leaflets? And then I go down and I put them in my GP surgery. Hmm. That's, that's basically um, all the awareness that's done. Yeah. OK, thank you. Okay, thank you. That, um, might, uh, that we'd have a, an, Im an input into this um, and, and I have a list of potential um, doctors and, and organisations that might be of, of, of interest in terms of... Um, With us, that would be useful. Can yes. I just take Alexander Burnett and then I think we need to wind up just in terms of time. Uh, can I thank the convener uh, for allowing me to attend today and speak to the petition and can I thank Janie and Lorraine uh, uh, for uh, informing the committee uh, on what's a truly terrible and debilitating disease. Uh, yeah, for my part, as you mentioned, we, we held a, a private members debate earlier in the year, uh, which had, I'm very grateful for cross-party support, but it received uh, not only uh, from all those of us with rural constituencies where this was, maybe there was a misconception that this was only occurring in, but I think, uh, as Angus MacDonald's alluded to, uh, yeah, we've been very successful in getting more people into the countryside uh, from urban areas, and that's brought its own challenge as well, that they're often returning uh, back to their homes and their local uh, GPs in urban areas who are not aware of uh, the problems. Uh, and so that goes right to the point of awareness and education. Um, uh, after the debate, we also held an event here, which was extremely well attended. Uh, I know there have been some uh, problems with people signing the petition, some IT issues. So yeah, c certainly the numbers that attended the event are, are greater than the number that seem to have been able to sign the petition here, and I think that should be noted for the record. Uh, it was attended not only by people from all across Scotland, uh, people suffering, but also people working uh, to try and uh, eradicate the disease uh, uh, through um, uh, removing vectors uh, for ticks, uh, but also attended by people from across the United Kingdom and also uh, from abroad. So I think it should be recognised as a truly global uh, uh, issue uh, that we have an opportunity to address today. Um, you know, this you know, what I find so terrible is that this Parliament has looked at this uh, Lyme disease uh, now for over 10 years, uh, and I think it has a responsibility both to sufferers uh, and to countryside users. You know, we are currently encouraging schools, uh, people on Duke of Edinburgh schemes, scouts, guides, uh, all, all ranges of uh, ages and, and groups of people to go out to the countryside, uh, yet we are uh, failing them, and I think it, you know, being negligent uh, in informing of, of the dangers and the very grave dangers uh, uh, that, that exist uh, and if they, if they were to catch Lyme disease. Um, yeah, it is clearly a disease that is not getting the attention it needs uh, and I hope that the Petitions Committee today uh, takes the opportunity to address that uh, and in turn the Scottish Parliament uh, takes the opportunity uh, to catch up with uh, so many other countries which are dealing with it. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Can I just maybe ask one very last thing? You mentioned the development of NICE guide and guidelines in your opening statement and the feedback that you received from the Chief Medical Officer in Health Improvement Scotland. Has there been any reference made to the development of sign guidelines? No, no, no. there hasn't. No. Well, that's, that's obviously something that we can um, pursue. Can I thank you very much for your attendance? We now need to think about 
um, how we want to take this petition forward. My sense is that we do want to take it forward. I think the issue of responsibility around something that clearly this whole area of work needs to be developed. Um, it's got powerful arguments for that today. Um, can I have suggestions from the committee about what we now do? Rona? Scottish Government and the UK Government and the various um, interested stakeholders, um, Lyme Disease UK, Lyme Disease Action, SNH, um, NICE. Um, and also, I, I was quite shocked to hear that only 3% of GPs had taken up the training. So could we maybe write to the GP body, I don't know what you call it, but just to ask them about that and get the response to that. Okay, and if, if the, the witnesses, as you think you've already suggested, um, you have suggestions for stakeholders that would be worthwhile our contacting, you can obviously just feed that back to the clerks. That, that, be, that would be um, excellent. We can just we can, um, get that at the end of the meeting. Um, and I think that we would be obviously keen that this matter has progressed. I think there's a whole range there that we've suggested um, and perhaps suggesting also an NHS board because they must be given advice within their own systems. Yeah. Angus? Convener, thanks. Could I also suggest we write to NFUS and Scottish Land and Estates to get their views okay. on the issue as well? It's for the Veterinary Council as well, but funny enough, Lyme disease has been well promoted through the equine world at the moment. Um, there's, a, there's a growing awareness and they seem to be doing quite a good job. So it might be worth linking up with some of the animal welfare side as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. the Protection Network's Lyme disease subgroup is a Professor Dominic Miller, who's a, a vet, and he would be well worth contacting. Yeah. Okay, as I've said, if there's a list there that we can you know, ensure the clerks have, uh, have access to, then we can make sure that we get as much information back as possible. Is there any way that um, we could get information from, like, so the doctors that have all the research and are curing people at the moment, like Dr Horowitz, because I think he'd be quite happy to work with the government? I think, well, my sense would be in the first instance we should write to stakeholders. Mm -hmm. You clearly have a somebody who is regards an expert elsewhere, and that's something that we can reflect on further once we know yeah. what the medical profession and other related organisations within Scotland and the UK are actually doing, but that's not not something we would close our door to, I don't think, at all. Um, can I again thank the petitioners very much for your evidence and can I suspend the meeting briefly to allow for um, um, as a change of witnesses. We will be coming back to you about the whole issue of responses we've received and when will next be considering the petition and you'll have an opportunity to respond further. Thank you. Order. Before we move on to the next um, item of business, can I just say that our discussions this morning have, uh, to say the least, have run over a little longer than we expected, and I think that's understandable given the, the evidence that was brought to us, and it's really important that um, witnesses have the opportunity to feel that their case has been properly heard. I think that does mean, however, that we have less time to discuss the new petitions on the agenda, and we're also keen, I think, that we give them 
proper time. So my suggestion is that in order to ensure these petitions um, are given full consideration, I would suggest that we um, reschedule them um, to our meeting next week. And that means we can afford a proper opportunity for this petition. We have to be finished by 2012, I think. So rather than putting ourselves under pressure around this petition and not giving proper time with respect to new petitions, my suggestion we deal with that next week. Is that agreed? Great. Okay, thank you very much. In that case, we can now move on to the final petition that the committee will take evidence on today, which is petition 1664 on greater protection for mountain hares. The petition was lodged by Harry Hutton on behalf of the charity One Kind. I invite um, you to provide a brief opening statement of no more than five minutes, after which we'll move to questions from committee members. OK, uh, many thanks. And can I start actually by thanking the committee for taking the time uh, to consider this petition on behalf of our supporters and those who signed it. Um, mountain hares are native to Scotland uh, and they're a conservation priority at the EU level. Um, they're listed um, on Annex 5 of the EU Habitats Directive. At the UK level, they're priority species under the Biodiversity Action Plan, and at the Scottish level, um, they're on the Scottish Biodiversity List. And yet they are culled and um, killed for recreation in very large numbers across the highlands and the borders, which is their, uh, their range in Scotland. Um, the killing outside of the closed season, um, which applies from the 1st of March until the 31st of July, um, is unregulated and not monitored. Um, and the mountain hare population itself is also not systematically monitored. So it's actually impossible to say what impact it's having um, on the mountain hare population or indeed on the welfare of um, the individuals. But we do know that uh, a large number of mountain hares are killed each year. One, in fact, the only study uh, commissioned by SNH um, found that approximately 25,000 um, were killed for example, in a one-year period in 2006-07, and that's thought to be somewhere between 5 and 14% of the population. And in recent years, it appears that large-scale um, culling has become a routine part of, uh, I guess, intensive grouse moor management um, under the belief that it will result in uh, a lower transmission of lapping ill virus to red grouse tricks and so higher red grouse populations. And that's consistent with accounts and photos of um, large-scale culls, and we've summarised those in a report um, I have here, and it's available on our website. It was published on the 1st of August, and I'll just draw the attention of the committee to the uh, most recent um, example, um, which uh, is a photo taken by a wildlife photographer who was up um, I think it's just north of the Cairngorms National Park. He was out taking photos of the red grouse. Um, and then this vehicle um, drove past him and he took, he took this photo, which shows, I guess, uh, the cleanup after a cull. Um, so a lot of uh, mountain hare carcasses that took place. Well, the photo was taken about four o'clock on the 28th of February, um, which is the last few hours of the open season on mountain hares. Um, in addition to these kind of systematic culls, I guess it's also important to note that recreational killing raises quite serious conservation and welfare concerns. Um, it involves a large number of animals, and our own research found about 25 companies offering um, this online, usually offering um, 8 to 10 animals per gun for walk-up hunts, or up to 200 uh, a day for a driven hunt, so a large number of animals. Um, the Scottish Government have made a number of significant interventions. I would just highlight three. Firstly, starting in 2014, they called for voluntary restraint on large-scale culls, and since then, the Scottish Government has made it clear that their policy is uh, not to support uh, large-scale culls. Secondly, earlier this year, SNH um, confirmed that it would no longer permit the snaring of mountain hares, and we welcome this as very significant progress um, because of the, the very serious welfare concerns around that practice. And thirdly, on the 31st of May, the Cabinet Secretary announced uh, an independent group will be established to look at the environmental impact of uh, grouse moor management, including uh, mountain hare culls. Our petition calls for greater protection um, of mountain hares, and we've put forward a number of recommendations um, in our submission to the committee as to how that could be achieved. Um, I hope they will be considered um, in this inquiry and by uh, the Scottish Government. I would also like to underline a further very simple and practical recommendation which we have made, which is that mountain hare killing could simply be licensed by ex uh, extending the close season so it applies all year round. Um, but I also wanted to underline to the committee that whilst we have an inquiry, there are a number of issues that are not being um, addressed. So I hope that the inquiry will consider mountain hare culls and their impact in full, so on welfare 
and on conservation and put forward a long-term solution. But I think we all have to recognise that it will take some time um, to take that to, you know, from uh, the inquiry and then to implementation. The group hasn't yet even been formed. Um, and so I wanted to emphasise, I guess, the urgent need for some kind of interim protection um, for mountain hares that could take uh, effect in time for this year's culling season, which is generally uh, the winter. Um, so I guess in summary, you know, the Scottish Government has a long-held policy against large-scale culls. Um, the calls kind of for a voluntary approach to restraint appear not to have worked, and this is leading to, you know, the continued unwarranted persecution and suffering of this species. It also undermines, I guess, the authority of the Scottish Government if it's saying it's against this and has done for a long time but nothing is happening. And it makes it impossible for Scotland to demonstrate that it is meeting its obligations uh, under the Habitats Directive for this species. And so um, we therefore, I guess, like to ask the Scottish Parliament to um, call on the Cabinet Secretary to acknowledge that this voluntary approach isn't working and to use existing powers um, to introduce interim protections for the mountain hare um, while the inquiry uh, looks in the, at the issue in full and develops a long-term solution to this problem. Okay, thank you very much. Can you just clarify for me that in your submission, you refer to proposals you've made to the Scottish Government to improve the protection of mountain hares. And what's their response been? Um, well, we understand. So we've written to the Cabinet Secretary um, this, about this time last year with these proposals, and we've told that they're under consideration and that they want more evidence um, of culls taking place. Um, it's quite hard. And so are they seeking the evidence? Well, I think it was a general call for evidence, uh, as it were. You know, so if you're aware of a cull happening, mm -hmm. then make the Scottish Government aware. And that's partly why we pulled together this report in August. This pulls together everything, all the uh, reports of culls that have taken place that we're aware of. One of the difficulties here is because this isn't a regulated activity in any way, and because it happens mostly in the middle of winter in quite remote locations, you know, public encounters with culls are obviously um, relatively rare. I mean, the one I cited with the wildlife photographer, um, he was, you know, up, he was actually in his car, leaning out of his car with a long lens, um, enjoying the red grouse when it drove past, and that's how he happened to get a photo. So you, lucky is the wrong word, but it is a relatively rare occasion that you're going to encounter a cull and be able to report it. Thanks for that. Can I ask just it feels a bit kind of counterintuitive to me that in the evidence we were given, it suggested that mountain hare are strongly associated with the heather moorland that's managed for red grouse and where they benefit from habitat management and predator control aimed at improving grouse densities. I've probably got this completely wrong, but does that mean there are more mountain hare precisely because there is more, um, there are man made or human made? Um, habitat in order to, to allow for, you know, grouse sport or whatever? Yeah, so part of the management regime of grouse moors creates, um, uh, I guess, a good environment for mountain hares. So, uh, for example, predator control um, means that mountain hares will thrive more. The heather environment that's maintained for grouse is also uh, a good habitat for mountain hares. So you will get mountain hares um, doing well um, on grouse moors. That's absolutely right. Um, but in terms of the overall population trend, it's actually quite difficult to answer, and I think this is covered partly in um, the, the briefing to the committee, because it's not, there's no systematic monitoring. There is research currently being conducted, commissioned by the Scottish Government, into developing better methodologies for counting mountain hares that I hope will at one point lead us to an actual population estimate so we can provide um, you know, an authoritative uh, overview of how the population is doing but until then all we can go on is the bits of data we have which is some monitoring by uh, the British Trust for Ornithology who is part of their breeding bird survey also monitors some mammals including mountain hares their data um, from 1994 uh, to um, 2014 suggested a fairly significant decline in more recent years it's gone up a little bit so it might be that we're in a cycle of population, it's hard to tell. Um, but then other kind of, I guess, there's more also reports of more localised 
um, extinctions or reductions in populations. So the Mammal Society, for example, note a number of moors where they were once common, but they are uh, no longer. And um, Adam Watson, who's a leading ecologist in this field, also notes um, areas, particularly in the West Highlands, where you would expect to see uh, mountain hares and where you once did, are now in greatly reduced uh, numbers. Okay, thank you. Uh, Michelle Ballantyne. Yes, thank you. You've made reference to, to the um, Scottish Government's re response towards um, a package of measures to, to protect birds of prey. Um, how do you think those, those may address some of the problems you're talking about? And looking at the, the actions you're requiring immediately, um, you made reference to the fact that the group hasn't been set up yet and it, it'll take a while. But I, I have to confess, slightly confused now, because you're saying the, ha the very habitats where it's happening is increasing numbers. So would, would you expect then there to be a prolific increase in numbers during your moratorium, for example? Well, it would be interesting to monitor that. Um, so your first question was, um, with the inquiry set up, what the, else do we want? The is actions that right? for uh, over birds of prey, how mm -hmm. do you think that will yeah. help directly help mountain hares? I mean, we've yet to see what the inquiry will recommend, but one of the um, measures they are, they've been asked to look at is licensing of grouse moors. Um, so it'll depend on how that's constructed, um, but it could, for example, uh, require estates to um, report on control of mountain hares and other species. Remember, we're operating in an environment where we have very little data. So anything we can do to actually increase transparency as to what's happening uh, would certainly help. Um, and, but I would hope that the inquiry will also look at specific measures um, to protect uh, mountain hares. I mean, in, in terms of, and then your second uh, question was the kind of paradox about a grouse moor is quite a good habitat uh, for mountain hares. So that's absolutely right. Um, it can be a good habitat for mountain hares, but I don't think we would we would argue that that doesn't justify culling them. No, no, my question was, if, mm -hmm. if you have your three-year moratorium, would you then expect to see a, a, well, we would hope to a, see a an large effect. increase? It would be quite hard to measure because we've got no baseline data. But yes, one would hope to see them doing better if, they, if there was a moratorium on killing them, yes. Hi. Thank you. Good morning. Um, you mentioned in your petition that you've liaised with the Cairngorms National Park Authority. What was the outcome of those discussions? Um, <clears throat> my understanding from the Cairngorms National Park Authority is that they've considered the issue um, at uh, the board level and that they are encouraging um, estates to increase transparency um, as to how um, their uh, estates are managed and what culls and number of animals uh, involved in those culls are taken out, mm -hmm. uh, take place. Thank you. Can I just ask you? Mm -hmm. um, can I just go back to licensing and regulation that you talked about? Mm -hmm. um, how easy or you know how straightforward would that be to do? Is it would it be a huge administrative thing? And are, are people likely to take it up? And you know, do you mean it should be it should be legislated for or? Yeah, so I mean, licensing of um, grouse moors is will hopefully be, a, I guess, a bigger policy uh, in that it will take, it will consider a lot of issues and problems related to grouse moor uh, management. I mean, one uh, a recent study published by SNH that was looking at um, how hunting is regulated in other EU countries actually showed that Scotland is one of the more loosely regulated countries relative to others and so I think there very much is and indeed as all of these problems show space um, to introduce uh, new uh, regulation. I think the inquiry will be able to answer your question in full though because they'll be able to look at how a licensing scheme could be constructed, what it should include and how it could be um, delivered. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Angus MacDonald. Okay, thanks. Um, you, you've already made reference to the uh, research project being conducted by the, the Scottish Government, but uh, can you tell us more about who's been involved in the project and its scope, um, and also uh, your understanding of when the findings of the project will be available? Um, I can certainly relay my understanding of that, and it will be um, useful, actually, to get an update. But my 
understanding from Scottish Natural Heritage um, is that the work has been commissioned through uh, the James Hutton Institute to develop a and trial a methodology for, for providing um, a uh, mountain hare kind of population census. Um, so that's been trialled on a number of estates and the work should be published towards the end of the year. The challenge we have is that it doesn't answer a lot, it won't immediately or for some time answer a lot of the questions that we have, i.e. it won't give us a national population um, uh, estimate, nor will it tell us much about the impact um, that culling and recreational killing is having on that population. So for that to happen, again, my understanding is that further research would need to be done to effectively apply that methodology. Um, so, you know, it's, it's baby steps, it's welcome, um, but it's going to be some time before it begins to answer those questions, which again, I think underlines um, the importance for some kind of interim uh, measure to protect mountain hares. And that interim measure, uh, as you would prefer, would be a three-year moratorium? A moratorium uh, seems like the obvious approach. It's compatible with um, the Scottish Government's position against large-scale culls and it has support from conservation organisations. Again, we haven't, what we've tried to do is put forward a number of ways of approaching this. Um, and the, the other um, possibility would be simply to extend the licensing regime. We have a licensing regime set up that applies for five months of the year. So why don't we just extend that for the whole year round? And if we ran that for a few years, not only I think would that result in fewer mountain hares um, being killed, but it would provide really quite essential data about the level to which this species um, is being uh, controlled. Um, I would point the committee to a similar arrangement that was introduced five years ago for seal killing in Scotland, um, which brought move from unregulated to licensed and resulted in a big reduction um, in the number of seals killed, um, but has also brought transparency to the sector. Every three months, SNH publishes the latest data as to you know the uh, number of licenses issued um, and the number of seals killed under licence, which is essential both from a conservation and indeed a welfare perspective. Okay, thanks. Um, it's helpful to have that on record. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Brian Quito. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, your petition recognises that uh, one of the reasons that uh, the culling of the mountain here is is to control the tick-borne uh, louping virus uh, among grouse. And, we have other petitions that raise the issue to do with ticks and the economic benefit of uh, driven grouse, grouse shooting, which perhaps you can see the, 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 there is a sort of conflict there, if you might, within, within the, uh, the petitions coming into the, the petitions committee. And I wonder if you recognise the concerns that exist uh, um, about mountain here having an impact on other activities that may bring economic benefit to Scotland. Yes, indeed, and I listened to the previous petition with um, with a uh, strong interest. I mean, the so let's start at the beginning, which is that, according to the study commissioned by SNH that I cited earlier, about fifty percent of um, the hares killed in that year was part of organised culls on grouse moors to control um, ticks under the or with the aim of reducing um, the the prevalence of lauping ill in red grouse chicks. So effectively the aim is to uh, sustain a higher population of red grouse for, for shooting by controlling you know, the tick vector. The, the problem with that is that there's no evidence that it works. And so this is a quote from SNH scientific experts who looked into it and looked at the scientific literature relating um, to this issue. And they say, they concluded with, there is no clear evidence that mountain hare culls serve to increase red grouse densities. Um, so I think it's based more on an assumption uh, rather than on any actual evidence. Um, as for, now that's lauping ill, which is obviously uh, a different virus from the one that the committee um, was considering in the previous um, evidence session. Um, I have heard people claim that it may result in reduced uh, prevalence of Lyme's disease as well, but I've seen no evidence. Indeed, there's no evidence that mountain hares transmit uh, of a case of um, Lyme's disease being transmitted uh, by mountain hares, nor is there evidence, again, that any control of mountain hares would result in 
um, lower uh, prevalence of Lyme's disease amongst humans. So it's also obviously not part of any kind of, it's not a serious proposal being considered on the health side of the Scottish Government or, or, or such like. So as far as I'm aware, that's not, the two issues are not linked in that way. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that. Are there any other final questions? I think it is quite interesting the other petitions that have come to the committee kind of reflect on perhaps some of the challenges between protecting the mountain here and the fact that it's thriving in a managed environment, which in other cases perhaps some environmental groups would be concerned about, and also this implication for a condition that clearly hasn't properly been addressed or understood by the the medical profession. So I think there are interesting connections there that we would probably above our pay scale to have to deal with. But um, I think there's some interesting um, questions here. In terms of taking the petition forward, have we got suggestions from the committee? Brian? I think the, the, the obvious one would be to write to, given, given that the um, government's previous um, interest in this, to write them to see where really currently the current thoughts lie with this petition. Anything else? Um, I think Angus. it's also worth uh, seeking the views of, of stakeholders, including uh, SNH, SLE, uh, Scottish Wildlife Trust, the James Hutton Institute, and the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust. OK. And if there are further stakeholders that we think would be useful, we'd have a view. Um, if, if these are fed in, then we can address that too. So is that agreed by the committee? Clarification element for the snaring, because that can be done presumably quite simply. Right? What's that, sorry? L looking at the the petition requested that we clarify that snaring of mountain hares is illegal, so we can do that presumably quite straightforwardly. Yeah, we can we can yeah. raise that with the Scottish Government as well. Angus? I think it goes on to say in the petition that it's now been satisfactorily addressed in the recent SNH review on snaring. Yeah, Since this, SNH have indeed clarified. Um, that they will no longer licence um, the snaring of mountain hares, which we've welcomed. So there's no action required on that. Okay, in that case, um, I think we've agreed what, what, how we will take that petition forward. And again, um, you will have the opportunity to comment on any evidence or response that comes in from the Scottish Government and others. So can I thank you very much for your attendance. I'm going to suspend for a minute to let you move and then I'm going to deal with one last item of business which is suspend just very, very briefly. And thank you very much. Reminder that we're not going to be dealing with um, the, the item three or new petitions in which we're not taking evidence. What I do want to do is deal with the final uh, item for today, which was consideration of one continued petition, petition 1593, which calls for a full review of the offensive behaviour at Football and Threatening Communication Scotland Act 2012. We last considered this petition at our meeting on the 29th of September 2016, when we agreed to defer further consideration of the petition until the outcome of James Kelly MSP's consultation on a proposed member's bill was known. As members are now aware, the outcome of that, propose, of that process was that Mr Kelly was able to secure sufficient support for his proposal and has now introduced the Offensive Behaviour at Football and Threatening Communications Repeal Scotland Bill. This bill is currently going through Stage 1 consideration by the Justice Committee. Committee. So I think there is a question for us about whether there's a continuing relevance for the petition, given that what was called for in the petition is now actively being um, pursued through the legislative process. Angus? Uh, thanks, um, Camille. I think uh, this petition should be closed, given that action has already, as you say, been taken by uh, the Justice Committee, which would make further work on this by the Petitions Committee seem uh, redundant. Uh, and. As we know, there's also the review of hate crime, uh, which is underway and will include the OBFA uh, being looked at. So I would move to close. OK, and so that would be under uh, Rule 15.7 of Standing Orders. Um, we would be closing the petition on the basis that the action called for in the petition is reflected in the Offensive Behaviour at Football and Threatening Communications Repeal Scotland Bill, introduced by James Kelly. 
we'll always have the opportunities of Parliament to vote in the bill in, in due course. And I think Angus Macdonald's comments on the work of the Scottish Government in this area is, all, is also relevant. So is that agreed? Agreed. Okay, with that, can I thank you very much for your attendance and I close the meeting.